Why hello there, welcome back to the show. It's I, your host, Agostino Zinga, and this is another episode of the Agostino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to know. If it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below with all your thoughts, feelings and suggestions and I'd love to hear what you have to say. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five star review. I've seen plenty on there already. Five, four, three, two, one, whatever it is, let me know, feedback it, input it into the Apple podcast system so it helps to get my podcast popped up the little algorithm chart. That would be greatly appreciated. And of course, support via Patreon is welcome to at patreon.com for just agostino if you want to hear some of my x-rated raving stories only are available via the patreon so find them on there as well as documentary recommendations and reviews movie reviews too you can find on there so make sure you jump on the patreon episode new episodes are available at the end of every single week on patreon.com for just agostino without fail and you got to register for as one dollar or equivalent of one pound per month you get to start my entire patreon um content so get involved on there jump in there don't delay today my friends but yeah man how's life how is life how is life i hope you are well wherever you may be i'm feeling good somewhat you know clogged up but as per usual what can you do you know if you've got me kicking my ass these times you know standard 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 um today is kind of a bit of a monumental day a little bit of a monumental day not so much of a monumental day depending on how you view it but because I'm not a very sentimental guy, I don't really celebrate birthdays, Valentines, and all those nonsense things, right? I think men who do those nonsense things are the same kind of guys that are into horoscopes, right? You're not the, my kind of guy. You probably need to jog on. Um, that, that's where I can be a little bit cis that way. I can be a bit um, heteroperformative or heteronormative in that way, in the things that I don't like that, you know, some people do like nowadays because they pretend to like them in order to get into girls' pants for the most part. It's honestly the truth. If you meet, if you're a girl out there, um, or you're a dude and you want, and you and you happen to bump into a fuckboy, a good way to kind of tell who a fuckboy is is if they pretend to be interested in really feminine things like you know astrology or like celebrating their birthday. If you meet a dude who's announcing his birthday week the week prior to his birthday week, you've definitely got a fuckboy in your hands. If you're seeing a guy who's telling you about his you know his star signs unprompted during your first interaction with him or the first time you actually met him in like a you know one-to-one -one intimate venue he's definitely going to be a fuckboy all those things are usually one-on-one -on -one fuckboy traits for the most part and i try to avoid it i can be a little bit you know what's that word called I can be a little bit unnecessarily persistent with my approaches to some of the people in the opposite sex. I can, I've, I've known to be that way. Do not get denied in that way. I'm sure I've got my simping ways, which I'd be highly embarrassed about. But the one thing that I don't do, one thing I don't do is declare it to be my season because of my flipping star sign and the day that I happen to be brought into this world, which I have no control over. And also just don't celebrate a flipping arbitrary day, which you know happens to be my birthday every single year because I think it's a bit ridiculous after the age of 21. But again, maybe that's just me. Maybe it's just me. But anyway, we do have a, a bit of a monumental day today because today's the 500th episode of the Agassino Zingo Show. That's 500, 500 episodes of me talking to myself through a microphone into a computer and then getting out to you, wherever you may be, a podcast, you know, application you're using, watching it through YouTube or whatever it may be. 500 episodes. Absolutely nuts, right? That I've been able to do this for this long um, during, you know, for this, um, yeah, for this long and for to be this consistent. It might be the only thing in my life consistently in terms of a project, in terms of something like, I would say has a tad hint of artistic expression creative endeavor um imagination involved that i actually committed to doing for what's this seven plus years or whatever it is i've been doing this podcast it's absolutely insane and i can't thank any of you out there more then I'm going to thank you now for any of the good feedback I've been getting, bad feedback I've been getting. I don't really mind it. I think, you know, in general, because I've been on the Internet for a lot of my life, I know how it is. And I know if you put yourself out there and you present work and you're proud of it, you are going to get people that love it. You're going to people that get to hate it. Some people are going to be in between. But regardless, I kind of, you know, um, appreciate all the comments 
all the views, however little, however large it may be. I think the fact that you're giving someone like myself a chance and listen to what I have to say is absolutely insane considering the plethora of flipping uh, people out there spouting their nonsense. I know how I how I know how picky I am with the time that I spend online and who I spend it with. Um, I know sometimes I could just see someone's face or, or flipping a thumbnail and I could be like, nah, not for me and move on. So the fact that you guys see my ugly mug and you still want to click and you still want to listen and you still want to engage, you still want to like, you still want to share you want to comment you want to send me a dm on instagram you want to send me stuff and whatever it may be i had people sending me things like it's absolutely nuts right just to, to, to see that and i really really appreciate it and i don't know like i said like i said before in episode one i started this legitimately as like a weird form of therapy as you guys can know or as you guys have probably been able to surmise as you've seen me talking on this podcast for you know years and years if not months and months or weeks or whenever you jumped on you would probably surmise that i probably don't have that many friends i probably don't go out with a lot of people or I, don't get me wrong i have a lot of group i have a small group of good friends but i have a big cohort of friends i hang around with um date on a day-to-day -day basis i have my own issues with that we could spend another day but the kind of the nucleus of this podcast was essentially to allow me to somehow get all these thoughts out of my head and just be able to flush them out stuff that i've been thinking about you know topics that i've been ruminating over stuff i've seen in the news things i've been thinking about in my own life um how i would approach certain situations all these sort of things i kind of wanted to be able to kind of speak about on my podcast have a neutral platform and just be able to get it out to you openly and if anything my main inspirations behind this have always been people like bill burr obviously he does his own solo podcast that he's absolutely fantastic at um joe rogan and of course in recent years tim dillon who's also really good at doing a sort of solo podcast with a couple of guests maybe bouncing off here and there i had there's been, I think on one hand, I can count on one hand the times I've asked people to appear on my podcast. I think only in the last couple of years I've done so. They've mostly been DJs. It's all kind of fallen through. And I've kind of been happy it has fallen through because I still think at the end of the day, this platform or this channel that I have is mostly so you can come and hear what I have to say about certain things so I can kind of relay that back to you people. And in general, I don't really care or enjoy interviewing people um, for the most part. I'm not really big on it in general, especially when it comes to artists. I much prefer to just consume their work, um, consume their artistry in whatever way they want to present it to me and then have a fantasy or an imagination of what they may be like as people. And if I bump into them, I bump into them. But sometimes engaging with people that you look up to, engaging with people that you like, it can sometimes um, be a bad thing, right? They always tell you not to meet your heroes and they say that for a reason. And when you're doing stuff like this, and it's a kind of, you know, it's instantaneous. I just plug in my microphone. I've got a proper expensive one now. I've kind of upgraded from the USB mic that I used before. Actually, it's funny. When I first started this, I used to use a dictaphone. I bought like a Sony dictaphone. The whole idea behind it was like, I tried to prove to myself that I could get stuff out and ship. I think that was when I was reading um, Seth Godin books and stuff. And he always prioritizes shipping, 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 like getting your work out there. Um, and the other guy too, I forgot what his name is. Oh, I forgot the other book where he talks about it too. But essentially, creative people spend way too much time, you know, dilly-dallying, pontificating, procrastinating on an idea instead of just getting out, getting it out in this possible, in this kind of minimalist, viable form as possible, but just getting it out and ready to ship. Like similar to what, you know, Elon does with Tesla and all that kind of stuff, right? They always have a working prototype. It's never just a prototype, just on stage, just for the sake of it. There's always a prototype that you can actually sit in and enjoy after the presentation. So the idea behind it is that, hey, we're going to be able to, we're, we're planning to ship this. This is not fantasy. So I remember buying a dictaphone from like Argos for like 20 pounds or something and recording the first i think 15 episodes if you go back to the action zinger show from episode number one to 15 were basically recorded on a dictaphone i recorded on a dictaphone talk about the subject i was talking about while i was reading stuff on my computer and i plug it into my computer and then kind of you know basically chuck it into um whatever audio software i was using and then upload it and that basically said to me oh wow you can do you know you can probably basically put out put out the minimal viable product, get people to engage in that and of course build up as you go along and that's what I've been able to do over the last few years and hopefully I hope that I've improved somewhat from the first episodes to the episodes now um, but yeah it's been a hell of a journey um, again 500 episodes on my own talking to a microphone absolutely nuts it could be seen as some sort of form of uh, mental illness right because I say a lot of the times whenever I see a girl on Instagram with like a whole grid on her feed full of selfies or even a dude sometimes full of just selfies of himself like standing in front of a mirror 
it sometimes is a cry for help and i think you know maybe having 500 episodes of me ranting or raving into a microphone might be a bit of a cry for help too but you know what you guys are helping me along the way so i'm not bothered that it is that is a cry for help and i just try and get on with it to the best of my ability but yeah thank you so much again for making it a 500 um, episodes to remember um really grateful for it there's going to be bigger and brighter things happening in the not so distant future i'm looking at getting a studio i'm looking at again maybe having some more guests on here maybe further down the line makes it up a little bit more interesting um also going to look forward to doing more live streams um specifically on a podcast but more so maybe on the open tab show which i'm having to change now because Bert crash has come back with these open tab show so i don't have the same name because i jacked off him because he stopped doing it but now he's back doing it so i have to change the name of the open tab show the little open, the little live stream that i do so that will obviously be changing as well further down the line but yeah loads of good things coming up in the, on the pipeline of course my youtube channel is always going to grow i'm going to have a few more bits of content editing stuff that i'm going to be doing over the next few um weeks and months of course i've got the patreon going don't have many subscribers on there at the moment backers but again if you want to support that you can in the patreon link down below like i said i'm going to try and do as much bespoke content on there as possible uh, i've got some like scene or i've got some like event review sort of thing similar to what would happen on you'd see on like you know the ra resident advisor event reviews the things that i used to love um and kind of live off of back in the day but they were kind of a bit defunct now because all the great writers and resident advisors are left so i kind of do audio versions of them further down the line i'm going to make them a little bit more polished they're going to be some field recordings included there's going to be exclusive clips on there and just kind of bespoke content again movie reviews documentary reviews all that you'll be able to see on the patreon so definitely jump on there so i'm trying to make this as multifaceted as possible and then outside of that of course i've got all the photography stuff going on I'm, I'm developing a bunch of pictures that i'm hoping to put up in an exhibition or some sort of book very very soon um of course the djing stuff is a bit of a pause at the moment i'm not playing in a lot of the, of the bars and pubs I was doing it previously because since the pandemic it looks like no one's really got back to going as they were prior so now i'm probably gonna have to turn the djing thing into like a live stream thing and because live streaming has kicked off in the last few years of course because of pandemic hopefully i'll be able to use a live stream as a way to kind of showcase my skills and then maybe use that to kind of you know maybe get some bookings in the future so loads of things i'm doing loads of things i'm kind of um dipping my toes into and fingers and all that malarkey and hopefully down the line things should get to where they need to get to but again it's all come off the back of this because i've been able to see myself do this consistently consistently um and do it to a certain standard um and obviously have some sort of viewership behind it even if it's 100 people a thousand i don't mind the fact that people are still watching it shows people like it and if i build and continue doing so little by little over the years the numbers will increase so because i'm seeing that i'm seeing evidence that you know my voice is valid my voice is necessary people like to hear what i have to say they don't like what i have to hear this, what i like what i have to say regardless it's still kind of a good reaction so that should hopefully feed into my other projects and give me you know inspiration to kind of get going with those kind of things so again thank you again for the 500 episode support i really really appreciate it all your support is really really um appreciated highly um messages emails the likes subscribes um you know the downloads of app, whatever whatever you do to, to subscribe and to support me definitely i it doesn't go unnoticed i reply to everybody that asked you send a message through if you ever send a message on dms on the instagram you know i reply back and i'm always kind of on on deck to kind of offer any kind of advice or whatever you need so again thank you for the 500 episode support and i'm just gonna keep on keep it on okay so now we got all that kind of softy wafty thing out of the way I should need to blow my nose as well because you know what can you do let's jump on in to some other episodes some topics actually we need to speak about regarding the show um okay so first things first i want to talk about it's not really something this is an interesting one right so united of course lost to aston villa over the weekend right aston villa beat manchester united at home which i think for most people who have watched us play this season, especially the last few matches, it shouldn't be a surprise. Most people that watched us play last season also shouldn't be surprised either. And the season before that, because unfortunately, unlike, you know, despite our pretty decent league position finishes, the actual football we play under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer isn't great. And we don't seem to have like a designated or distinguishable style of play. Well, even a style of play that's maybe going to bring out the best in the players that we have available, you know, um, Oligon Social Lives talk a lot about fast attacking players and counter attacking football, but unfortunately, you can't play that way all the time against all the teams because some of the lesser teams or some of the teams that just want to adopt better tactics will decide to kind of drop off, defend with a low block, and then instantly that space you want to run into isn't available. So you're unable to win. And sometimes, even if the space is 
is available doesn't mean necessarily just because you've got all your attacking players on the pitch you're going to necessarily outscore or outgun the other side that you're facing so a lot of people have always had trep you know hesitations about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's tenure there seems some issues there they think that even though like that the fact that we signed Sancho Varane and Ronaldo only one window a lot of fans didn't think that was going to be enough for him to win the league or to win a trophy forget the league just to win a trophy even a league cup which obviously we got knocked out of in a week as well no one really thought that was ever going to happen and I think a lot of the fans who are quote-unquote Oli out were quite reasonable, I felt, in their assertion, especially off the back of what Tuchel did at Chelsea. Unfortunately, a lot, I know a lot of people kind of get upset about that example being used, but it's an example that we have to use because it's something that is kind of um, a sort of like-for-like -like comparison in a, in, in a way, right? Because Lampard, ex is experience-wise, um, was far less experienced than someone like an Oli Gunnar Solskjaer who's got like 10 years experience in the game um, he obviously came through with a far less um, you know he had managed less clubs of course than Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and the fact that he was failing so much at Chelsea despite being a club legend despite being given the resources and then for him to get sacked in the middle of the season Tuchel to come in take over and take them from like seventh where they were to I think third and then they obviously won a Champions League it showed people that sometimes you know even though a lot of people said that Chelsea team needed a lot of work um, Lampard was the one that was saying that they were far, far off from challenging for the title and winning any trophies. But then Tuchel immediately got them believing. And now they're in this season. Obviously, it'd be a big step for them to go to third to f from third to first. But they were still an understanding that this is what kind of elite coaching looks like. And unfortunately, Lampard maybe will become a better coach in the future for it. But at this current moment, he probably isn't at the level needed to survive the cutthroat industry of football that occupies that kind of top echelon. That's what a lot of people were saying about Oli. That's it. Just saying that maybe he's, you know, he's done a good job now. He's stabilized us. He's kind of taken over from um, Mourinho, who was incredibly toxic and made Old Trafford um, a very poisonous and venomous, you know, place to be. A lot of kind of, I think I've I said before in a few other Twitter spaces that I've been in, um, that I think a lot of the division um, amongst United fans about it's Oli in, Oli out, people that go to the game and don't go to the game, and all this kind of stuff, give him time, don't give him time. I think majorly spawned from the Jose Mourinho era. era sorry, he made uh, the fan base very, very toxic and people kind of fighting against each other, which doesn't necessarily solve anything because, you know, the common enemy that we have is definitely the Glazers and the ownership and how they've kind of run this football very poorly over the years. Bloody blah, blah, blah. Oli's not that great of a manager as has been proven so far. And I think the general consensus I thought this season going into it was, I think a lot of people were basically wondering, myself included, would it be possible for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to win a trophy with great players despite his clear indeficiencies or kind of mistakes that he does when it comes to substitutions tactics selections from time to time any manager does it but he seems to do them a lot he seems to kind of do them often in the kind of big clutch moments he's he seems to fire on one side and then of course the players then seem to fail again on the pitch themselves who knows it's because of his instructions or because of themselves but we don't know but i'll say i was going into the season thinking to myself hey can this guy potentially win us a trophy despite him being quite an average coach and we've seen evidence of it before Roberto Di Matteo at Chelsea won the Champions League again he's not much of a manager I'm not sure if he's even managing a club at this at this present moment in time but quite soon after that new season he was sacked, he was sacked of course because he didn't do a good job but that was further proof that you can maybe get a caretaker manager to come in especially if the team has stacked with experienced um, serial winners they could maybe kind of you know um um stabilize things and kind of get themselves over the line when they're playing cup competition right which is basically one of games of the one of game but it's f quite hard to do that in the league nearly impossible you know sustain that over um a premier league season is quite difficult you don't win the league by a fluke you don't win the league with having a terrible manager you need to basically have you know a pretty decent team um and a great manager in order to kind of win the league and so far we've seen with how we started in the league so far and maybe the last three results in combination that maybe Oli may, uh, might not be the guy, especially with the players we have available now, because, you know, the only pushback you hear from people is like, oh, we need a DM, we need a DM, but we've got enough players on the pitch, enough quality, enough people to choose from to make a pretty decent team that we shouldn't be losing at home to Aston Villa. Don't get me wrong, you're not going to win every single game in the league, I understand that, but you should lose um, your more 
your, your games against maybe your bogey sides away from home, maybe against your kind of title rivals from time to time. But you shouldn't be leave, losing, I think, banker three pointers, even against Aston Villa, especially Aston Villa, uh, you know, without a Jack Grealish, who are in this kind of transition period where they're trying to find their feet. You should be kind of putting these teams to bed, or at least, you know, coming away with it as a draw and then going again next game. So we lose at the end, you know, with a header and then miss a penalty. Bruno Fernandes, I thought, of course, was the icing on the cake. But it looks like suddenly now the press and the media who were very protective of Oli, who were basically making every excuse under the book under the sun for him, are suddenly starting to change their tune. And I'm quite conflicted by it because I think a lot of the times football media, football journalism is super um, reactive. It's super knee jerk. No one's ever proactive. No one's ever thinking about things long term or, you know, kind of specking things out and saying, okay, let's follow some trends. Let's answer some data from before. Everything's just short term knee jerk kind of reactions. And fans were raising reservations about Oli's. Um, you know, ability to lead this team after his second season at the club, maybe beginning of his third. They were seriously thinking, hey, if he's not able to win a trophy, maybe even last season, um, maybe it might be time just to kind of hand this team over to an actual better coach. Of course, some people would view it as unfair, but quite clearly, there's not shown any evidence so far that he's got any ability to win as a trophy. And I think this season, especially with the League Cup, forget the Europa League, that's facing a pretty decent Villarreal side. Again, you know, with, with a great coach and a great history of you know European competitions or one of cup competition games in general fair enough um, you might go out tactic in the final whatever but I thought the league cup is a bit of a gimme it's a bit of an easy trophy to win because most Premier League sides definitely usually fill their weakened teams because they don't really want to be in a competition anymore so you can progress quite quickly and quite far especially with the FA Cup only starting next year the League Cup would have been a great way just to claim a free trophy, put that in your cabinet, and then shut up everyone that says you haven't won a trophy. And then immediately, I think a free trophy would instantly buy um, Oli another season. Instantly. Maybe even 18 months. That would instantly get him if he would have won that trophy. But the fact that he didn't go for it, the fact that he made 11 changes, thinking that he could rotate in that way, um, just showed me that he lacks that killer edge, that real kind of, you know what Mourinho did when he was kind of cringy and he was like holding up the four fingers or the three fingers, I forgot it was because we won the Europa League and he was including the charity shield or something, something stupid like that, right? It's a bit cringe, but I like the fact that when he comes in, he wants to win the first trophy available, whether it's a community shield, the league cup, it doesn't matter. He wants to get a trophy in the in the bank, in trophy cabinet, sorry, and he wants to instill that winning mentality into his squad so that they know he means business. Like we want to win everything inside, everything inside. So every game is crucial. And at United, you have to do that. You can't just coast along waiting for things to develop and get better. You have to win trophies. And now it looks like the tide is finally changing. People are starting to expect a little bit more from Oligan Solskjaer. As you can see from this headline, courtesy of the Manchester Evening News, article written by Samuel Luckhurst that says Oligan Solskjaer is not managing United um, with tactics. And then you've got here, um, da, 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 you've got no, this, uh, yeah, you've got this clip again from the Sky Sports News of Gary Never talking in his podcast about how he feels um, Ligana Solskjaer is managing and the deficiencies he's saying, he's seeing. And this is all the stuff that we've been saying. We've been, like, everyone that's been kind of critical of Oli and his tenure and his coaching has always said it's all individual brilliance. We don't really have any coaching. We have any systems of play outside of the counter attack. Um, it looks like we rely on individual brilliance. If our individual players don't show up, we generally lose games. We concede goals all the time. We don't really play well. Uh, Brighton play a bit of football than us. All these things that we were saying in general on social, now he's trying to echo. And again, it's two years too late, but it's great to hear it regardless. So this is Gary Neville thoughts on Gary on Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's tactics and formations off the back of again that loss to Aston Villa in the league away from home. I said it, even when they were winning, even when Ronaldo scored, they don't play well enough as a team to win this league in my view. They don't play well enough as a team. Um, I think that you have to be a unit in possession and out of possession. And when but the funny thing is, he said that we don't play well enough as a team. But Gary never also said that if we sign Harry Kane, we're going to guarantee us to win a trophy or to win the league, right? To challenge. But Harry Kane hasn't scored a goal, I think, what, this season, right? He's on a barren goal run. He's looking miserable, moody, because maybe he didn't secure his transfer to Man City. And he's basically seeing that his career is basically going to be wasted at Spurs because he's a bit of a flat track bully and didn't have ambition and didn't want to push for a move beforehand and didn't work into his contract some sort of exit clause that would allow him to leave so he's obviously kicking up a bit of stink I understand but still he has himself to blame but Gary Neville said clearly that if we get Harry Kane in we're going to challenge or come close I forgot what it was but something along the lines of that and then when when Jerry Redknapp pushed back to him and said hey 
They've got Ronaldo, one of the best players in the world, right? Second only to Messi. Why can't he be the one to challenge the league? He was like, nah, I still don't see it. So it's 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 never the it's always the players' faults that he needs. It's always more players that we need. We need more signings. And it's never a question about the coaching. Never. That's never what separates. That's never the deciding factor about why we didn't finish higher up in the league or why we didn't finish with more points or why we didn't maybe challenge for the title. That's never it. It's always the players. Always more players needed. Always more players needed. Always transfers. Always transfers. Bit of bullshit, but what can you do? Come on, play. Wow. Play. When you only deliver in moments, those moments won't go for you in certain games. You need patterns of play. You need a way of playing. And I, at this moment in time, still see a group of individuals playing in moments with some patterns and combinations at time, but still a team that's, you know, some of them pretty new together. Obviously, Ronaldo, Varane, Sancho's not settled in yet. Uh, but... They've got to come together as a team and start to define a style of play. And then you start to get results when you don't play well. And I think the way they are at the moment, they'll always have days like that yesterday. They'll have patches of, you know, four or five games where they'll only win two. But then they'll go and win 15 on the bounce and be unbeaten away from home for I don't know how long. That's the type of team they are. I have called them the odd bunch. Because I still look at them and think as though they're a team that wins games in moments. When I look at Chelsea and I look at Liverpool and I look at City, they're teams. They, 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 they put Okay, then what's the issue? Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has been in a tenure for three years. Why hasn't he put a team together that can challenge? Why hasn't he constructed that? Why we don't we have a defensive midfielder? Clearly, we need one. Clearly, at the moment, Fred and McTominay isn't the answer. Matic is getting a bit long in the tooth. So we need to have somebody that can either sit in that position on their own or play as a two with either Pogba, a Van der Beek or whoever, I don't care. That's not happened so far. Why hasn't that happened? Why in three years has it not happened? So on one hand, you can credit Oli for re you know, rejuvenating uh, United and bringing back the good vibes and allowing people to smile again. But on the other side, if that's the case and he gets all that praise for doing that, he also needs some criticism for not entirely making us a cohesive team. We can't be reliant on individual brilliance to win league titles and trophies. Trophies, maybe you can do. We got close to it with Europa League final, of course, last season. But in cons on a consistent basis, it's very difficult for you to kind of win things on a consistent basis, right? Back to back. Um, playing that way you have to have a system of play that allows you to play well despite some of your players maybe having an off day because you create you know patterns of play ways of playing uh sustained pressure tactics and formations that allow you to bring the best out of your players at the moment we just don't have it and this is again Ole Gunnar Solskjaer basically describing his tactics pretty openly and pretty clearly and this is everything that the fans have been talking about but whenever the fans talk about it it's always a bit like we're hating we're not giving him the guy credit he needs but this is essentially Oli describing his system of play and wanting to detail it and the funny thing is allegedly according to Johnny who I follow on Twitter about United News Oli was asked a question about his style of play a a couple of press conferences ago uh, by this dude Car Anchor I think his name is who helped write Marcus Rashford's book that's out at the moment and he basically asked him a question and he's a bit of an Oli inner like he's a bit of a fan of Oli right and he was asking him the question about his style of play in a kind of positive way to kind of be like hey why don't you shut up the haters and tell me about what kind of systems you want to play and what things you want the, the, the kind of probing him like hey I spoke to you last time let me know you know kind of tell me what you told them and Oli just refused to answer it or didn't want to answer it or didn't have an answer for it and essentially just said you know tactics and talking about the nuances of the game is overrated there's not a real need of it it's kind of going it's extra if you don't have good players you do good like just basically saying passion is basically the name of the game and it was like huh and again, this is a, the, the problem again for Oli is that it's in contrast with the two shows of this world. It's in contrast with the Klops. It's in contrast with the Peps, who are very kind of, um, you know, enthusiastically bubbly guys who are super, super addicted to football and tactics and coaching. You know, you can't get Klopp to shut up about how he wants to develop a team and how he develops youngsters and transfer targets he has and styles of play. You can't get those guys to shut up. If you speak to them about football, Pep, Tuchel, Klopp in press conferences, they perk up straight away. Ask them about transfers and all that sort of stuff. They get a little bit tired and bored of it. But ask them about actual tactics and why you decided this and that. And duh, 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 duh. They love that sort of stuff. But with Oli, he seems to not like it. He just wants to talk about passion uh, fitness 
um, you know, tenacity, all these things, pace, all these things that have nothing to do with actually being technically good at the game and understanding it. And I think that is what is causing, again, a disconnect with Oli and his tenure. Because at the moment, we're not, because I think it would be okay. If it worked, no one would care. It's sort of like Jose Mourinho. Jose Mourinho is only a problem for your team if that style of football doesn't work. But if it works, you don't give a toss that you park the bus. You don't give a toss that he height. He kind of buys players based on their height, weight and age. You don't care. But as long as it, as soon as it doesn't get results, you also you soon as it doesn't get results, you have a problem with it. Same goes for Oligan and Solskjaer. The style of play we're adopting at the moment isn't working. Um, his way of playing the football, playing football isn't working. The players aren't responding in the right ways, even though we've got all the right players, quote unquote. It's not working at the moment, so naturally going to get pushed back. But again, this is Oligan and Solskjaer explaining his style of play, and it's pretty fancy, fascinating. Sorry. The definition of the Oligan and Solskjaer style. And how does it blend into the Manchester United way of traditionally playing? Of course, I've been affected by my many, many years here as a player. And uh, then as a coach, uh, after I was a player, now I'm, I come back as a manager. The traditionally best Man United teams have quick attacks, fast players. We break quickly. Uh, we got quality individuals. We got uh, width. We got uh, individuals who can make a difference. Um, I think if you see a re like a video reel of the best goals, many many goals are individual quality or fast attacks, quick counter attacks. See Ronaldo's free kicks or Rooney's and Ronaldo's counter. So yeah, that's basically it. individual brilliance, right? And then again, let's go back to this article. It says the main life title challenging squad. Uh, have a chance to squad, but some doubts persist as to whether they can have a title challenge manager. Luis Brito Santo was always um, on to hiding at Tottenham with the club's uh, initial aversion to appointing him as well as being a replacement. Nuno was dismissed because of his compact style and deemed expensive. Weeks later, Spurs appointed him. For a manager whose Wolves programme notes were shorter than a footnote, Nuno was laudably forthright after Tottenham's embarrassing loss against Sunderland, saying a lot of things went wrong starting with the decision I made. The game plan didn't work. I'm honest. I have to say that. I decided bad. I take that right decision and I refuse to go up more further than that. The surgeon Daniel leave his approval ratings um that the naive Kane brothers triggered a brief this but anyway Oligan Solskjaer bristled at questions about the choice of penalty taker and Cristiano's reaction as he shredded the pitch, punching the corner flag en route to a tunnel. Solskjaer mumbled usual penalties and cliches when talking about accountability would be received favorably around match goers. He said instead um there was another Adoni, um, anodyne analysis of the officiating of the Premier League. The video system referee is a subjective and inconsistent system that is erratic pitch referees, but is here to stay. David Gea was not getting to Courtney House's header, regardless of the offside. Solskjaer's aversion, sorry, Solskjaer's diversion tactics are about as successful as his on pitch tactics. He is not a natural enough orator to put them at the top of the agenda, and there is karma for the pre match ca uh, carping about the shortage of penalties when Bruno sent his spot kick into orbit, which is true. There is you know, he did kind of complain about it because he thought that Klopp's comments about our penalties and frequency of getting penalties last season maybe affected the fact that we haven't had a couple of penalties this season. United supporters were instead miffed at another goal conceded from a set piece and another delayed attack and substitution. Solskjaer was compromised by the on-force withdrawal of Luke Shaw and Harry Maguire. There was an there was an inordinate wait for a proactive move and Ezra Cavani was not the most um, strategic of choices. The tone was set within the risk aversion midfield of Scott McTominay and Fred. Um, they have the started three in the, they they have started in three of the six Premier League fixtures and has Scott McTominay not acquired a groin injury, um, groin, groin surgery sorry last month that the midfield access might have been the same for all six matches of course because he said that's his preferred system this is where i think ollie lets himself down i think you're always going to lose games it's obviously standard but i think the decision making choices in terms of substitutions and tactics and what to do to affect the game always kind of leave me a bit miffed so the harry Maguire thing is a good example he allegedly got injured i think just before half time i think if i'm not mistaken or maybe just after he got something some sort of injury when he was wanting to stretch for something or whatever it may be and he was clearly disrupted by it, a grain injury or something along the kind of lines, right? Um, something went wrong. And uh, obviously, you know, he's a captain, even though I think, you know, it's pretty uh, lucky to be captain of United considering, you know, how 
average he is as a defender, but regardless, he's our captain. He's our marquee centre back in the terms of you know the fee and the profile, blah 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 blah. Not profile, maybe the fee. So I understand maybe the kind of hesitancy and not to take him off straight away. You want to see it help him, let him kind of run it off. But considering we're playing against such a fast, attacking, aggressive kind of Aston Villa side. And it's especially when you consider the kind of the flow of the game, it would have made more sense to just make an executive decision and get him off the pitch as soon as possible, especially if we are struggling, because, you know, he's not got the pace necessary anyway to kind of keep up with those players as they're kind of pinging in around him. So it would have made more sense just to kind of change it up and get someone else off on the pitch. Cool. The Edison Cavani change towards the end, again, probably came too late. And in my opinion, might have been the worst decision to make. Because there was space that what that we had to basically exploit because Villa were pushing far up and they had their full backs kind of trying to ping back our full backs, but it led us a lot of space behind with their free centre backs just to attack them. I would have maybe brought on either a Lingard or a Sancho to basically stretch their defence a little bit and maybe even a wild card in Martial. But I don't think Ed's Cavani was the best decision at that time. Now, of course, he was a compromise in that position because Luke Shaw and Harry Maguire go from as as uh, you know enforced injuries, so you only have one substitute left but I still think you could have made something a little bit more astute you could have been a little bit more clever with what you kind of put out there on a the pitch to change things around that would have made far better that would have made maybe a far more impactful difference in terms of how we played but again we move it continues as United have a auspic auspicious sorry win percentage of 58% when McTominay and Fred in lineup losing just 10 of 55 matches they were the midfield pair par and duo they were the midfield duo in Paris the guy never asked where Scotia wanted his statue to be eradicated erected sorry the breakup of the McFred also is a consequence of the Europa League final when Solskjaer overloaded the front six, refused to drop and overplayed, underperforming Marcus Rashford, and failed to make a single attacking substitution um, against an ob ob uh, obdurant, obdurant opponents. <laughs> That's fun. That's enough diplomacy. McTominay and Fred do not have the makings of a title challenge in Giro. Never will. Roy Keane called it a unit a year ago. He said they won't get United back to winning titles. Each player is good, dependable squad option, and there is merit to reprogramming uh, McTominay to keep a vigil at the base of the midfield, which I don't think is true. I actually think McTominay's best position is as a number eight. He's clearly a better box to box midfielder than he is as a conventional six or a four sitting, yeah, you know, six slash five sitting in that defensive uh, double pivot. I think he'll work far better in a 4-3-3 bombing forward um, I think you know again if you played for a smaller club and he was able to play as an attacking midfielder you'd see the best of him because he's very tenacious he's got a good engine on him he could obviously got a decent shot shooting ability he can head the ball he's obviously physically um, pretty big and strong all those things are kind of necessary to play in that kind of position and be that kind of marauding kind of midfielder but in terms of playing a disciplined number six number five role in the base of a midfield for Man United and requiring to basically transition and spray the ball around that just isn't his game he's not Declan Rice he never will be in that regard um, it continues says McTominay but the dependence on them together underlines undermines social status too often he does not manage like your United manager should for the thrashings of five goal holes Solskjaer is a stickler for pragmatism and his managerial mentality is at times more molded than United um, Villa were always likely to retain a back three even though the in ineligible and Axel Tuanzebi which demanded a creative midfield um, Solskjaer um, so Shag um, eroded this uh, on the side of caution preoccupied by Liv Villa's front two of Ollie Watkins and Danny Ings. Imagine the flip, flip in the Villa dressing room when they scanned the team sheet. So United have deprived themselves of a fifth forward with Jesse Lingard, Dish Sancho, Donny Van der Beek on the bench. Um, it's a little surprise United dropped points against the outside the leap. Um, when their manager is so easily caught between two stalls. He reacted to a red card against them, a fourth team side in Swiss League, by switching to a back three. United played for a 1-0 and then for a draw and then got neither. They got what they deserved. United have lost three of their last four games, departing one competition, so an increase is obligatory, especially after the manager selected an unchanged 11 when United were a kick away from drawing the week before. There's no rhyme or reason for fielding the same side against Villa that had performed so sporadically against West Ham and it's inconceivable that that had Mark Noble struck the ball beyond David De Gea's reach, that Solskjaer would have had at least one change in six days later. It's inexplicable how Fred retained his league place after a ramshackle performance against London, and one can only imagine what key made a Brazilian chucking, chuckling seconds after spooning his ball into touch. United's adversaries have raised their bar in recent years, and Solskjaer needs to respond. It doesn't. If he doesn't, he's onto a hiding. But that's why I, that's why I disagree. 
I don't necessarily think he's going to go anywhere. I think at the moment, our owners have basically shown us and proved over the years that as long as Solskjaer gets, as long as our managers get top four football, it's very difficult for them to justify sacking them because essentially they use United as a basically, a, you know, a, a flipping cash point um, to erect, to kind of take out dividends from the club. So as long as we're able to make top four football and secure, um, you know, Premier League, sorry, secure European football and get that money in from the TV rights and whatnot, then we're basically good. And kind of winning trophies is kind of a second, it's kind of something that comes, you know, second, especially be able to secure high profile signings, you get them to sell shirts and all that and all that stuff. So if Solskjaer can get top four football, I really do worry for our club in that we might kind of, you know, just slowly trudge along into obs obscurity without really doing much. And I'd much rather we be proactive and decide that, hey, Solskjaer has maybe been one of the most important directors of football that's not a director of football in the club's history in terms of what he's been able to do in terms of changing around our fortunes and kind of revamping the squad and making us believe again especially after the disastrous 10 years we've had in previous managers and that should be noted and kind of clapped and adored and sort of applauded from afar but then it's time to hand this over to an actual elite manager who can take our players to another level and you hope to do so because Klopp has shown it he can do you know he can make wonders out of kind of fairly you know average and players that you probably wouldn't really you know kick up much of a fuss about the Rigas I look at as likes of right even the Shakiris are now Leon he was able to get those players to kind of perform for him and step up when need be and they were able to create some monumentally histor historical moments um, for Liverpool in their history um, obviously Tuchel has done it his way too maybe he's had a bit, a bigger checkbook same with Pep but they still have an ability to coach their side they don't just simply buy players and that's it they still coach they still get them to perform at elite level and still they kind of fall short but on a consistent level they're always consist competing for trophies competing for the league and if we want that for United we're probably going to have to change manager that's just the nature of the game, isn't it? But, you know, what do I know? Next on the list, we have this news courtesy of ESPN regarding UFC star John Jones and his arrest for a misdemeanor domestic violence charge in Las Vegas. Before we get into the story, this is why I want to point this out, mainly because in my life, I have kind of generally been the person that a lot of people would come to to ask for advice, especially when I was working you know, a few companies ago, that was a fairly kind of clout notoriety, uh, yeah, a, a pretty much a clout noty, huh? a clout not not I don't know, whatever. Yeah, a job that had a lot of clout, right? That a lot of people kind of wanted to get, a, a, lot, a, lot, a job that kind of gave me a lot of social capital, a job that people were impressed by when I mentioned it at a bar and pub, and um, or when I went out and stuff. And at that time, people would ask me, oh, wow, you're doing all this stuff, you're running marathons, you're reading four books a month, you're learning a language, da, 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 da. how do you do it, how do you do it, how do you do it, I want to do it, I want to do it to myself. And I'd be very resistant to kind of giving people advice because generally I know how much of a fuck up I am and I know how much of a piece of shit I am and the stuff that I've done in my life and still do in my life that are quite destructive and probably don't lead me to making the best decisions in the things that I want to do in my career. And I don't know if I want to kind of progress and get to a level that I really want to get to. I'm going to have to make some kind of real decisions in terms of how I live my life in general and kind of put some stuff to the side that I'm probably not willing to put aside just yet. But I know I have to do it. And I know that no amount of advice and someone sitting me down and telling me is going to change that so if i know that i'm quite strong-willed and i'm quite driven and i can't even listen to advice i very much doubt somebody that needs somebody else to listen to will do the same thing because again i'm a self-starter i don't ever go to people to ask for advice i read books i watch stuff online documentaries interviews to write whatever reading my own novels autobiographies my non-fiction my fiction i'm doing all that stuff i'm doing the reading i'm doing analysis i'm studying whatever i can study it's all kind of you know autodidact stuff i'm self-studying everything that i can do um but i'm not going out and seeking advice i'm not offering hey man do you know how to do this how do i do that no 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 i don't give a shit um, i just kind of know what needs to be done i know what my heroes and my idols i've kind of look up to have done in the past and i try and replicate that in my own way that's basically it but some people do need that helping and doing a bit of advice in order to kind of get to where they need to get to and then there's some people that just don't ever get there but they kind of succeed this in spite of their mistakes. And some people, for the most part, most people aren't as lucky as John Jones and you don't succeed. You keep making the mistakes and you keep falling and you keep going back to where you were before that you don't like, but you never ever progress in life. It never gets any better for you. So I think with the John Jones example, he's succeeding despite his obvious mishaps and his, his deficiencies and stuff. But I think it's also a solid and reminder to most people that that's why... 
seeking advice and hoping for a lightning bolt to hit your head or going to a conference or whatever, um, listening to a self-help guru, all these kind of things, or even reading books like I do, won't do anything until you decide yourself to make a change. And John Jones has had many opportunities. He's had many quote-unquote wake-up calls where he could suddenly turn his life around, but he's more kind of obsessed with presenting an image like he's a good person which a lot of people do nowadays especially on social media everyone wants to pretend on social media and act like a good person retweeting liking something sharing a blackout square all this nonsense instead of actually doing the thing because it's much harder to do right i had people on my on my flipping podcast complaining ranting and raving at me that i was kind of misreporting the news on gabby petito that young girl unfortunately who disappeared and was unfortunately found dead and maybe not accurately describing the situation and the disparity in terms of reporting from you know um people from uh minority communities going missing and people vis-a-vis -vis white people in the united states all this malarkey again like i'm a news flipping platform which i'm not i'm just a podcast guy chatting shit into a microphone but still those people that are complaining to me that i'm not reporting it accurately or i'm saying the wrong things go on their platforms go on their social media feeds or whatever access to whatever internet they have are they doing the thing that they want to see being done in the world are they trying to rewrite the wrongs are they sharing cases of unreported um or kind of yeah underreported um instances of people going missing from minority from minority places no they're not they'd much rather point the finger and say oh this person isn't doing that than do it themselves because again that's easier to do than actually doing the work than maybe setting up a charity going and handing out leaflets talking to somebody in your local community and see how you can impact change no let's just go and point the finger and John Jones is the same thing he's more worried about letting you know he's a Christian born again wearing a jumper talking all calm and measured just the other just before this the other week he was talking about how oh, he changed and he's trying to be a different person but he's also trying to be a bit controversial so he can stir up some debate and get himself off in the headlines all this sort of stuff and then wow he does get himself in the headline with something that might be innocuous who knows it might just be like a, a lover's tiff you know people you know get charged and arrested for domestic violence all the time it's sad it's out of order but it does happen a lot in relationships and you'd imagine with john jones being a ufc fighter i would imagine people that have that sort of profession there is a likelihood if you you know marry somebody or in relationship with somebody that essentially gets to Go, go into a cage and you know essentially have permission to kill somebody in a combat fight that maybe there might be an opportunity for that sort of stuff to happen because you know whatever cte and all that stuff cool i understand but still he keeps making the same mistake again and again and again it never keeps changing but he still keeps um succeeding quote unquote in his, his career and i think most people are like this most people just kind of figure stuff out in life and they figure out how to survive and get by despite their shortcomings and that's why i don't like to for advice in general when it comes to things i think people just need to let the penny drop for themselves need to figure out on their own regard uh, and there's nothing you or i can say to somebody that's going to suddenly make them you know and um, turn a new leaf i know most people have that friend in your social group who always has a woe is me story is always a victim it's never their fault you try and help them out trying to make them understandable trying to make them be a bit self-aware it never happens and it probably never will or it will and it'll happen because they decided to finally kind of take off the rose tinted glasses and this is one instance of it anyway Let's get to the story. ESPN UFC, John, John, UFC star John Jones rested on misdemeanor domestic violence charge in Las Vegas. Um, it says the following. Da, 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 da. It says here, yeah, UFC star John Jones. Da, da, da. Jones is being charged with a misdemeanor battery, domestic violence injuring or tampering of a vehicle. A felony officer, Larry Hadfield of the Las Vegas Metro PD, told ESPN. He is currently being held at Clark County Detention Center, according to online inmate records. His, t his total bail is 8000 but Jones is on a 12 of our hold per records he's scheduled to have his first appearance early called uh, la uh, las vegas court at saturday at 1 30 p.m john was arrested at 5 44 a.m which is never a good time to get arrested because it generally means you're up again on it you know a bit on the on the old sniff sniff on the friday a resort in las vegas boulevard flamingo road hadfield it's hard to bring this guy to las vegas for any reason um this city is not good for John Jones. Here we are again, says Dana Jones. Says Dana White, sorry. Um, White said, it's not even shocking anymore. When we bring him here, it's almost expected. We can't even get him to Las Vegas for less than 12 hours and induct him into the Hall of Fame. It's a problem. This guy's got a lot of demons, man. A lot of demons. So, of course, right? He's meant to get inducted into the flipping UFC Hall of Fame. It's going to be a big deal. Um, the first time I've obviously done that kind of thing. And he goes to Las Vegas. And whatever happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. And then, boom. 
Jones advisor Richard Schaffner told ESPN's Mark Koppinger, Mark Koppinger, the facts are developing. We really didn't know yet the full story, so I'm not going to make any comment until I have a chance to talk to John until we have this no notes how this plays out. Jones 34 regarded perhaps as the best UFC fighter of all time he held the UFC light heavyweight title for the better part of nine years and has never truly been beaten in the cage his only career loss was a via controversial disqualification but the Albuquerque New Mexico native has been in trouble several times outside of the octagon including a felony hit and run arrest and two failed drug tests Jones has been bulking up for a return to heavyweight wanting to add another title to his collection he told he's been on Tuesday night before the UFC Hall of Fame ceremony that he weighed 255 pounds and was looking to bulk up to two for his heavyweight debut. Jones, a 2013 fight with Alexander Gutherson was inducted in the OUC Hall of Fame on Thursday night during a ceremony at the Park MGM. So, you know, clearly got his demons, clearly got his issues and is clearly never going to figure it out until he decides to figure it out. And I think most people in life are like this, but we just tend to get ourselves wrapped up in this fantasy that somehow if we hear a certain word for a certain person, we listen to a certain video, we get this certain quote in our head, we say this mantra, um, we bump into that person, that person introduces us, network, no, no, no. You're never going to figure it out until you figure it out. You're never going to make the change until you make the change. Um, no amount of wake-up calls is going to be enough. You have to decide what the wake-up call is. It, again, it would be much beneficial to not have those crazy wake-up calls where you get fired from a place or you you know you lose a relationship or you get excommunicated from your friendship group. You don't want those kind of catastrophic things for you to make a change. You want to be able to make a change ahead of time. Be proactive. Don't be reactive. But unfortunately, most humans, we only learn until we get severely burnt. And this is another example of it. So, you know, hopefully John Jones figures it out and gets to where he needs to get to because I still selfishly want to see him fight at heavyweight and see him compete at that level and see if he can kind of recapture the magic of him, you know, during the early times of him being a light heavyweight and looking amazing so far. He's kind of, kind of, it, full, it feels like Father Time is caught up with Jundra a little bit. He's not the most exciting and kind of eye-catching fighter to watch as much as in the cage anymore. He's still dominating, he's still freakishly good in terms of being able to beat up most guys and being a person a lot of people want to avoid. But his fights are a lot closer than what they need to be nowadays. He's getting tested by people who shouldn't be getting tested with. And again, once he goes to heavyweight with the extra power, the extra size, and of course the variety and different competitions he has there from the from, from the Francis Ngannos to the Stipe Miocic I really want to see him compete at that level but unfortunately it looks like it's going to be delayed somewhat maybe indefinitely who knows who knows moving on moving on the best news of the day and something I can finally confirm and my guess and my inside knowledge was definitely right so big up to the plug big up for the insight and letting me know and creeping to my dms and letting me know this little bit of a nugget but I was told pretty categorically maybe a month ago maybe more than a month ago that the Bergheim was looking to open around October I couldn't say on the podcast again because I didn't want to leak the information and get ahead of what my plug said because he said you know keep that information to yourself he or she I don't know if it is he or she because it's an anonymous account but regardless said to keep it to myself which I did keep it to myself but I was told more likely they going to be October now I was thinking myself to go around the end of the month. As I mentioned prior on this podcast, I was thinking of going for the um, Sylvester sort of New Year's Eve um, gatherings, which usually starts from the 31st to the 3rd to the 2nd to the 3rd, right? I think it's three days, yeah? I think it's 33rd. Or is it maybe 30, 31st, 30, 31st, 2nd, 1st, 2nd. I don't know. Whatever. It's three days. Anyway, three days, right? Um, or it's across three days. But it starts like, you know... At, 11.59 on the 31st you get to celebrate your flipping New Year's Eve and then it kind of rolls over to the 1st of January 2nd and 3rd I want to go there at least for two of those days three of those maybe fingers crossed I can do it I hope so I'm kind of touching wood and all that malarkey please 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 so that was the plan right that didn't happen cool no problem so I was thinking to myself you know what that's why I want to go anyway so we don't have any idea when it's going to open then I get this nugget of it's going to open in October I'm like yes finally I can start planning but still you're not too sure because the program and the times are at. I didn't want to book anything in case it got delayed or something happened you just know you never know with this pandemic things could always change you know at a moment's notice and again you know the most annoying thing about the early days of the pandemic was people who were booking holidays during the times when the traffic light system was a bit crazy and then they'll get annoyed when it changed last minute and people are like oh I booked this ticket I was gonna go here now I can't go it's like yeah duh we're living in a global pandemic things will change uh you know at the drop of a hat you need to be accepting these risks and at the moment Sorry, I just thought it was an un uh, it wasn't a risk 
risk worth taking, especially when I was going to get confirmation maybe fairly soon. And now we finally got confirmation from Bergheim and Sob because they've obviously released um, the program. And this is courtesy of Resident Advisor. It says Bergheim to reopen doors on October the 2nd. It'll be the club's first club night club night basically club match um since march 2020 absolutely insane right uh berlin club bergheim reopened its doors in october imagine kind of walking back again on this flipping sandy cobbled road standing there queuing with people acting all quiet and shy not wanting to sing thing in case somebody says that you're too fucked up or you're too drunk and you have to leave um get into the door uttering you or me or or whatever you want to say in English or German, right? You then get there, then you get searched and stuff, and you finally get that's where you're like, yeah! No, it's going to be so exciting. I can't wait, man. The first two um, club nights are scheduled for Saturday, October the 2nd, uh, with back to backs. Uh, the, 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 the rest of October, because during the, the, the pandemic, Berghain hosted a weekend garden parties and midweek events since July, um, as well as a studio Berlin exhibition. Now, I would have liked to have gone to the Berghain during these whole garden parties that they're having. Of course, you know, it didn't really make it that, it didn't really make much sense to go to like a day party in a Berghain without the ability to go to the actual Berghain itself. It kind of takes away the, if you, yeah, if, especially if you're not from there, it doesn't make sense to travel all the way there just to just essentially go to an outdoor party. You could go to yourself here in England. It doesn't make much sense. Much rather invest money in supporting the guys here who are still kind of getting back on their feet and um, then going over ab abroad and going there and doing that. And obviously now with the club reopen, you can go obviously do and do that. So we've got here a full listing of the programs for the opening night and it's looking banging the lineup is looking absolutely insane for the opening night um at the Berghain in october so 2nd of october they have ben clock in again I'm, i was right in terms of the date i said the third it says the second but essentially is the third because you know it's 11 59 p.m um main room or main area in Berghain. they've got ben clock back to back with myself deepman two residents in uh, you know Berghain playing back to back it's gonna be absolutely filthy um dj stingray electro indigo hector oaks oh wow he's doing opening night he must be super happy about that face fatal um roxy moore big up her steffi of course og um Berghain head you got of course um steffi sometimes plays Berger and Panorama again it's a good illustration of her ability to DJ at that level that she's able to kind of bounce between a very dark techno room and obviously a more flowery disco y housey stuff but again we move um, Panorama you got Chris Cruz Chromac Local Gabrielle Quartang I'm not really sure who she is Gabrielle Quartang or Wartang um, you got um, M Backer back to back with Massimino Pilagri who's playing I think at Crossbreed at Fold soon in October which I want to go to hopefully so that should be good to see him play you got tamasoma playing back to back with lakuti relationship goals there you got val Bordino and you got virginia as well playing upstairs at panorama bar if you don't know virginia you don't know steph you don't know steph you don't know virginia so pretty powerful opening night at the Bergheim going through and then you look at the other nights they're just as good um going through them d dan um yeah then d, d dan the following weekend uh dj tour at the cap hyperactivist so again loads of local people playing um or people you know that, that live in berlin or live in the proximity so that's nice to see that they kind of given a priority to those guys to get back on their feet and play i think that might be purposefully done i'd assume so um arm is playing again on the uh, on the following one uh there you see freddie k um of course he's obviously always a good um fix to see there some of the, i've actually i haven't actually seen freddie k play at burger and i've always heard the sets are incredible i think sometimes during the new year's eve sets i think he plays sometimes the is it one of the longer sets at the end one i'm not too sure but anyway he's he's a fairly um well regarded um in terms of playing in the burger people always have really good things to say about him um Bobby Diba, nini h Cynthi, fka ma4 oh wow the that's the guy that played in um Hua Berlin. He's playing at Panorama Bar. That's flipping sick booking. He's been able to get some. If you haven't seen this guy play before, um, he's got a couple of sets on yeah on that Hua Berlin site or uh, online radio show. He's really really good. So it's great to see him be able to play play at Panorama Bar. I'd like to think it's because they saw his sets online. So maybe it gives me hope if I'm able to stream on a consistent basis on my platform, they'll be able to see that I play really good and be like, hey, you come to want to want to play at Panorama Bar too? I'll be like. Oh i'll legitimately cry um god jansen is there um palms tracks moment wing who else i like here rod had of course uh fatty moham luke slater og madman matrix man mad 
yeah, honestly, sick, sick opening. I can't complain. I don't think anyone can. I'm pretty sure all these nights are going to be back to back to back, chock a block. Um, it, you're probably ill advised to go the opening night, especially considering how stellar that lineup is. But it might be worth a try because everyone likes to go to the first thing. I remember I went to the first ever fold when it first opened, the first party, and it was legendary. And it made me kind of fall in love with the club ever since. But, you know, sometimes going to first is a good thing so if you want to go maybe advice is as per usual to go what is it usually early sunday right is usually the good no sorry sunday yes sunday daytime usually is a good time to go that i've kind of got in really easily um i've usually struggled to get in panorama sometimes already panorama but opens up on a friday and then you've got the burger open up from the saturday onwards i usually find it a little bit more easier to go to panorama because it seems that less people go there because most people want to go for the dark dark techno shit i feel like i don't know if that's a good um you know estimation i guess it depends who plays up a panorama bar but usually i always find burger usually more full so i usually find fridays a good time to go regardless because you know you can get in but obviously you have to compete with the tourists of course with the pandemic that might have slowed the tourism down somewhat so i'm interested to see what the kind of intake is going to be in the in burger and panorama because if i remember correctly the last time i went was was it 2020 was it february 2020 or was it february 2019 Regardless, it was the last time it was open, right? Um, I went, was it 2020, 2019? Let me just double check. I went, da, 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 da. select the year here. I went, let's see if it was 2020. It might have been 2020, February. Because when I went there, it was pretty empty, right? Oh yeah, it was 2020, February. I remember, I remember the flyer design. So when I went in there, it was quite empty, more so than it's ever been i've ever been there before because i guess people were aware of the pandemic and things were maybe changing and you couldn't move around as easy as you wanted to um so if i can scroll down here of course you can see panel bars open on a friday i saw yeah this is the one i went i went last of the month so this is the one i went to i went to the one on the 29th of the second 2020 that was one of the you know last ones i think of the bird kind they did there right events when did it when did when was the last party they actually did uh, it looks like they ended them around April, right? That was their last, last event that they were doing. So last few months. And it was pretty empty, man. More so than it's ever been. Like, so empty that I was able to go right to the front of the booth. And usually, if you've ever gone been to Bergheim main floor, um, you'd know that it's quite difficult to get past the first row of dancers dancing on the plinths on the little boxes and getting past there because everyone's just like raging, get, you know, going absolutely nuts. So you have to kind of sometimes have to go through the kind of sidebar and then pop over to the front where the DJ is. And I'd never actually seen it the dj booth right so far in front that and usually sometimes you know again because people because when you go into those kind of places you're less thinking about standing next to the booth or doing that sort of corny stuff you're in there specifically to see someone play or to just hear good music or to just fucking dance your face off you're not really thinking about it but this time i obviously could because i could actually see the booth and i was surprised man. i was like jesus this is really empty compared to how it usually is and um Maybe that was an indication of, you know, the slowingness of the kind of, you know, techno tourism hadn't really kind of popped up as it was before. So I'm interested to see how it's going to be when it reopens. Is it going to be the same sort of um, um, people going there? Is it going to be a different crowd? Has the crowd much? Because again, I've seen it in England. I'm not sure I was in Berlin. I'd love for people in Berlin to let me know. But here in London, for the most part, I've definitely seen a change in the people that go out. Again, I've been out to a few places already. I've not been out to all the dirty places just yet, all the grimy places, but all the normal clubs I've been to and kind of day festivals. I have seen a kind of change in the clientele. It's a lot more older. Uh, people, are, are, people are obviously going for it or not going for it. There's no middle ground. It's just like people caning it and not and just going for the vibes. But there's less, definitely less people going out in general. I think we've probably lost about, I think, forget the tourism part but i think in terms of domestic people going i think we've lost about 20 to 30 percent i think someone mentioned it before at the um you know labyrinth open air but i think domestic um ravers we've lost about 20 to 30 who have maybe just moved on to other things and occupied their time with other hobbies and things they want to do but that definitely has affected the kind of overall intensity of the nights out you can still go out and have an absolute rager because we've still got the best some of the best club nights in the world some of the best djs playing here but in terms of the absolute ambience and the necessity to go out it's definitely kind of waned a little bit but i'm interested to see or interested to hear if it's been the same in berlin if you've noticed a change if like you know the 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 places around cop bus or tour or the kind of you know the bars and all that and all that stuff like even bars at eight millimeter bar right um in prince lauerberg i think is that somewhere around there right that kind of um indie rock kind of bar is that still for are people still going to those kind of places um i'd love to know um because that's definitely an indication of if things are back to normal even you know um 
stuff like Cate Blue, stuff like About Blank, um, stuff like Same Heads, all these places that were generally just always popping off in the weekends, regardless of who was playing, regardless of all the big techno places that exist, those, those are still kind of, you know, um, great places to go and kind of whittle, you know, whittle down the evening. I wonder if they're still around. I really do wonder if the vibe is still there the same. If you know, let me know in the comments. But yeah, Bergheim is back October 2nd, October 3rd. So get back on there if you want to. It's going to be an absolute monumental occasion. Everyone's going to be going crazy. I think when I eventually go, like I said, it's either going to be the end of November. Yeah, it's definitely going to be end of November or it's going to be the beginning of January for the New Year's Eve thing, right? And the plan is to go and take a bit of money and maybe get some merch as well because I just want to take advantage of it because getting stuff shipped over here, especially now since we're, you know, out of the EU and we're in Brexit, I'd love to pick up some merch and get some, you know, get some flipping soft goods from the site. A lot of it's definitely sold out, the orange, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, what else? Da -da -da -da. Yeah, all the stuff is sort of sold out, but I'm really looking forward to getting it. I really, really can't wait. So, yeah, um, keep an eye out for me confirming the dates and stuff. And if you happen to be in Berlin the same time as I, or if you live there or whatever, definitely hit me up. But I'm definitely looking to go end of November, even the beginning of January. But, yeah, Berghain is back open. Paranormal Bar is back open too can't wait it's definitely a mark that the world is reopening up and get to some level of normality and hopefully now all the division and the fighting on techno twitter and stuff can kind of simmer down people are getting back to doing what they need to do in terms of jobs i've noticed it too i don't know if you have but the discourse has slowed down it's not as vile as it was before because people generally didn't have an ability to make money pay rent you know be able to eat and whatever it may be and now you're able to do so festivals are popping up little by little wherever they may be shitty or not shitty it's still good to see people like doing what they know how to do best, which is sit down behind the flipping booth and play flipping records other people make. That's what they're good at. Given hot takes on Twitter and social media, I don't want to hear it. So great to see everyone back out doing what they know best. Boom. Moving on. Moving on. Let's move on quickly because I've wasted so much of your time already. This is courtesy of Mixed Mag. Unfortunately, we have to report another instance of somebody passing away due to taking an incorrect pill um, at a night out, which is always the most tragic thing, I think, for me. Because, of course, I'm a serial night um, go out goer, right? I'm a serial club goer or raver, whatever you may be called. And generally, I use nights out as a time for me to escape from the world, unplug, unwind, and just kind of engross myself in the environment I'm in, connect with other like minded people who are also into electronic slash dance music and maybe ingest a couple of, you know, illegal substances here and there, maybe a couple of drinks here and there, but mostly going out for the vibes of the night, listen to great music, and of course, just be inspired by the DJs and what they're playing. And it's really sad to see people going out with such high, um, you know, you know, uh, expectations or going out with such vigor and wanting to really celebrate something and being happy where they are and it to, to go from being so amazing like that and then it crashing the other way in terms of you know unfortunately um your life kind of you know ending at such a high moment your life just feels so unnecessary and the other sad part about it too is i think this is generally blood on the hands of the kind of of the uk government in general of how they've handled um harm reduction um drug education in general the fact that you know our supply chain overall has been disrupted majorly by brexit majorly again by the pandemic which is then leading to a short haul fall in terms of the amount of things that are coming into the uk or coming into parts wherever they are in europe which is then affecting the amount of risk that drug takers are drug yeah drug dealers are taking with the drugs they're sending i think i mentioned it in another podcast that allegedly drug dealers now because there's such a scrutiny and stuff kind of crossing borders and whatever they'd rather take a chance and try and smuggle over high earning high profit margin sort of stuff like coke and heroin as opposed to the pill stuff because it's not necessarily something you can make a lot of money on and it's more risk so because of that and the lack of frequency of the lorries and all that malarkey you know you've seen it obviously in the news i think it's essentially leading to a drought in the market which is then leading to a lot of bad characters a lot of bad actors coming up and trying to fill the void by supplying the stuff that's obviously not fit for purpose it's been mixed with loads of other shit and it's just not good stuff and i think anybody that's been out would attest to it that at the moment pills are at an all-time low let alone mdma is r ridiculously bad what we have available now in the market people are just generally start trying to stay away from it and try and do maybe some other things um that you can maybe find of good quality and unfortunately the kids who have been you know locked up for the past 18 months in their homes not being able to go 
go out and enjoy themselves or socialize with their family and or socialize with their friends at uni are now going out to clubs without that tolerance level that they used to have before or maybe it's their first drink or first night out and you know when you're young you think you're invincible you just go all the way so instead of taking half a pill you're taking four you're taking two and if the stuff's been bashed it, you may be able to you may be able to get away with it if you take it in small doses but taking it in one dose without eating or, or just drinking all alone um is definitely going to be a recipe for disaster and it's no surprise that some of these kids are passing away sometimes if it's mixed with fentanyl you obviously know how kind of lethal that drug is it's just a really unnecessary place to be in but you know we have to report these things we have to talk about these things a little bit to kind of raise awareness and hopefully get to a place where the government can maybe understand um the importance of harm reduction um people can speak more openly about the drugs that they take in general especially in the uk there's a lot of kind of you know um in clandestine drug taking that people don't want to talk about but most people that you know are getting on it on the weekends or weekdays people should be more open and talk about this kind of stuff and we should just go from there but anyway let's continue so pill warning issued as man dies after falling ill at manchester warehouse project it says here pill warnings have been issued um following the deaths of a 20 year old man in warehouse project during the early hours of saturday morning the manchester evening news has reported that around 3 a.m uh, 3 30 a.m officers were monitoring the mayfield um, depot club were informed that a man was unwell and had been transported to hospital the cause of death is not yet confirmed on the same night a 20 year old male was arrested suspicion of possessing drugs with the intent of supply while two men aged 23 and 22 with a 20 year old were arrested for suspicion of possession of class a substances now the underlying factor of it is that in most high profile clubs especially before maybe the, the pandemic and maybe especially before all these high profile deaths the actual agreement or the actual understanding was that there's a lot of high profile clubs that have agreements with like dealers and stuff underhand on the table behind the scenes no one knows about it so that they can get their good stuff in to ensure that the person actually selling on the dance floor is selling the best possible stuff right you test the stuff blah blah maybe the club takes a cut of it or whatever they turn a blind eye whatever of course a lot of risk involved in that because you're essentially um you know engaging yourself in an illegal act and you probably could have your license take away from you all it takes is one disgruntled employee realizing what you did telling the police and blah blah, blah. so no one let's talk about it openly but that culture exists in most kind of dance culture electronic music kind of places or bars and pub scenes around the world and that usually is a great way to kind of police what's coming into your club because in general you don't want a death on your hands because it just looks bad and especially if you're a nightclub especially if you're a nightclub in a small town especially whatever right especially if you already got a bad reputation like a fabric and stuff those things aren't going to help people kind of trust you on their nights out or trust you in their ability to kind of rave safely so you want that right but obviously that doesn't exist anymore because of you know the, whatever um sanctions have come in place and things have changed and the risk is not really worth the reward so clubs are doing the opposite and going the other way and going super hardcore the searches taking everything off of people and then when they go in there and they kind of meet somebody that's you know got bad intention and is selling stuff that they've made in their kitchen they're then desperate to buy it because they're fed up they kind of it sucks that they have been dismissed and the stuff that they bought before has obviously been chucked away so it creates a weird kind of kind of a I say a power vacuum but like a supply vacuum and again somebody that just makes up in the kitchen could step in and basically fill that void and then of course you're kind of rolling the dice or whether or not that's if it's safe or not so it's obviously a big issue with that kind of stuff and i wish we could have a far more nuanced discussion about it obviously don't agree with that guy what was his name dr something that went on joe rogan who said people should be allowed to take heroin and coke every single day work wise and it shouldn't be an issue it should just be the same as smoking weed which is clearly isn't uh, that isn't obviously the best way to go about things but there should be a little bit more of a, a sensible way we should go about doing things whether it's adopting the same thing that portugal do where you could have a, up to about 3.5 grams of um a particular drugs i think maybe it's most class a's for your personal possession which basically means most people can go out with a bit of stuff on them for a session and not have to worry about again this to taking away or having to buy something off of sellers that don't really yeah again see it, it kind of empowers the sellers to sell good stuff because there's no risk involved with the buyer buying it and it kind of improves the quality of the items that you get i'd imagine amsterdam's the same with weed because weed is like semi-legal there the quality of it is much better than the stuff that you would get over here because people are essentially having to grow it in a shoebox somewhere right do you know what i mean that's what it obviously equates to it continues here it says 
these guys are being held um, in custody for pending for investigation. Metropolis Drum and Bass Jungle event has been headlined by the DJs and DC Friction and Sub Focus. The incident comes after the death of a 20 year old man who became ill at the cause in London. There have been numerous instances of potentially harmful pills on the market since Clever returned in early England in July. Um, drug harm prevention organization The Loop has issued warnings about the d dangerous pills that are around the UK at the moment. The UK's ending race shortage in combination with the post Brexit transit issues have caused an increase in fake dangerous pills. Of course, MDMA powder. In response to the incident, the warehouse project The Loop posted an infographic containing the further of the substance found in the Louis Vuitton pill, which is reportedly bought in Manchester. So supposedly this pill is one that like causing all the issues. Louis Vuitton containing pills containing free MMC, which is very close to MDMA, but it's not. It's mostly methadrone that people used to take a lot back in the day called Meow Meow, but they're now kind of synthesizing it, put into a pill, and it just isn't um, great to take in that kind of dosage. Um, obviously, you're meant to take half or maybe quarter of that one half, and of course, kids going into these kind of places as soon as they get into it are just going to start getting on as soon as possible to make up for lost time, which is then, of course, causing issues with their health and stuff. Um, it says here, I guess, secret drug addict, duh, duh, sorry, the duh. Infographic states that multiple grey and beige pills tested at Parklife Festival reportedly bought in Manchester were found to con contain methadrone. 3MC is a caffeine similar to methadrone um, with strong euphoric and weaker stimulant effects. The drug harm protection um, group did not confirm whether the pill was delayed to the incident of warehouse project. A, sta a warehouse project statement said, we are devastated. We are working closely with the Manchester police. Police are appealing for anyone with the information. Yeah, but again, sad for the club because they're going to have this stain on them forever. It's never going to go away. You're going to be, sometimes people are going to be forced to, people are going to pressure you to kind of close. But again, should you, people come to those kind of clubs with taking the risk that they might, you know, fall down the stairs somewhat. It's no different to that. I understand. I don't know. It's a complicated issue to get into all that kind of stuff. But again, RIP to the kid that um, passed away. Um condolences go out to his family and friends sad situation to be in sad situation of course for the warehouse project themselves to kind of deal with as a staff having to discover somebody that obviously had overdosed or potentially had maybe taken a bad pill i can only imagine what that scene must have been like and yeah here we are in it here we are next we have news courtesy of mix mag again clubs and ibifa will be able to reopen from next week good news people over there still again it makes me so happy that we live in england or that i'm in london i feel so privileged that we've been able to club and enjoy stuff from july onwards and places like ibifa which are essentially without clubs what's the point of going to ibifa right it's just nuts but the fact that they've been able to kind of reopen now is definitely a great thing to see going forward it says here on october the 8th clubs and ibifa will be allowed to reopen according to an announcement made by today by the council the governor below lyrics the announcement came today with the approval of the covid certification to be used for entry into clubs and mandatory max wearing on the dance floors drinking will be only allowed while seated that's a bit shit all these kind of restrictions and shit but it sounds good regardless that they're opening um i'm sure they're not going to be fussy about it that the opening is just a good thing in general clubs can reopen at 75 percent capacity from next friday october 8th while the curfew is at 5 a.m while our beefers nightlife won't resemble pre-pandemic levels of hedonism indulgence um o'shea the uh, bisa agrees that it's deep it's a step so in the right direction the interesting part about it though is that i've definitely heard more american people especially people who watch on youtube and podcasts who have talked about going to ibifa e Ibiza, right? This past year or so than I've ever heard before, and it might be because it's a more it's, le it's less of a party island at the moment. Now it's more sort of a restaurant, bar thing, table service sort of vibe. So maybe they're more familiar or more happy to go there for that reason. I'm not too sure, but it's definitely seen an interesting or different mix i'd imagine if you live in a beef you've definitely seen it vis-a-vis -vis the kind of people going out for like weekends or stag do's or hen nights and stuff right or just parties in general dc10 it's not that same sort of crowd it's more so again people that are going for table service for bars and restaurants sit and have swanky things and you know be wine and dine by restaurateurs and have the ability to call girls back to your hotel room the nightlife organization added that they were very happy with the decision but that some clubs will need to decide if they want to open or not over the coming week Osio um, Diabith leisure manager um, Jose Luis Benitez told the periodico 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 Periodico, periodico de Apiza, that the responsibility that we have uh, to is being transformed, and we are going to ask our partners and clients for more responsibility, um, so that they don't take uh, any step backwards. To prevent the further closures of nightlife, the organization has backed the use of COVID certification, which will be used to enter clubs and venues from next weekend. The entire to return to Ibiza nightlife has been talked over the week. So yeah, this is no one's going to be fine against that. Now, if that's the final you know hurdle, they're going to just agree and move on. Which you know, I guess for the governments and this totalitarian control, 
it's a win for them because they essentially ground us all down to the ground. We were mostly in opposition, right? All us nightlife, hospitality people like, no more COVID passports. But in some cases, because they're unwilling to reopen our industries without their certificates, it's just a necessary evil you just kind of have to accept in order to get your life back to, you know, start it again and get up and running. And then you hope further down the line as things kind of slow down and cases get to a manageable level that they'll start to remove those restrictions and hurdles and people can start to go to those places without having to represent those certificates, you'd hope. Nightlife is currently open outdoors across the white IOs at 50% capacity on September the 15th to allow an unlimited amount of people to gather. Also allowing groups of eight to be seated indoors. The Balearic Islands are particularly back to normal. Um, we have very important flexibility of measures, but the distance between people and use of masks as well as ventilations is must and maintained, says the government spokesperson. So yeah, say 5% with some level of restrictions is still better than nothing. So big up by Bifa. Hopefully you guys are going to be enjoying that very, very soon from next week. Next on the list, we have this, which is good. Coach of Mixed Mag again. Black Music Coalition to host series of talks about progression since the Blackout Tuesday, which I'm happy to see some action, some follow up, um, you know, behind all these sort of performative steps that happen on social media. Remember when everyone was posting up their Blackout Tuesday square things and wanting to be part of the change and and all that stuff. I remember someone emailing me or DMing me saying, "Oh, I'm, I feel conflicted. I don't really want to put it up because it doesn't do nothing, but I feel pressured. I have to." I was like bruv like you don't have to do anything you know what i mean actions speak louder than words chucking up a flipping square on your social media feed and then actually not doing anything um in real life to basically empower or to change things isn't necessarily the way to go and i would argue especially when it comes to techno and all that sort of stuff and dance music as important as representation is representation is probably a kind of complicated topic to talk about because i think representation is needed across the board and it's not just based on race and gender. It's needed just in general, right? Lineups are boring. They're all the same. The ADEs, the time warps, all these places. It's the same people playing the same places over and over again. And then every year they have a group of like 20, 10 to 30 people who they kind of say are new, who have been on the scene for ages, who they kind of prop up as the next ones going forward. But again, you have to wait for them to become the the kind of Nina Kravitz of the scene. And then the next cycle comes in. There's not like a fresh car um, carousel of flipping talent coming in, playing at the biggest places, sharing stages with the biggest players playing in you know clubs around the world because the system is fucked right at the moment we don't have even clubs especially in the uk there's not a lot of clubs that have resident dj uh, programs that would allow somebody like myself to kind of build myself up to be able to play from like a thursday then go to a friday then maybe go to a sunday then go to a saturday it doesn't exist so someone like myself has to either make a track make a remix get linked up with somebody way more, way more kind of famous than i am um, play an opening set at a party that was well regarded people see oh yeah he's good book you for something else put on my own rave but it's, it requires a lot of kind of extra work outside of just being good at djing to get that level performing but when you have resident dj slots what that does especially if it's a really good club you play this resident dj fold your causes your fabrics and stuff your resident dj at these kind of places and you play on a regular basis on like let's say a dead night a wednesday a thursday maybe a sunday right and essentially what you do is that you gain the understanding and the ability to play in front of a crowd, especially a large crowd, a crowd that's expecting a certain level of music, um, it, you know, informed, good taste levels, da, 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 da. You're able to read the crowd, build up your understanding of music, how to DJ, how to read a room, da, 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 da. And then over time, that would allow you maybe to get better and better and better until the time, until the point where you then become a headliner for, you know, one of the best nights of the, of the month, whether it's Halloween weekend on a Friday, whatever it may be, right? That's how your kind of progression usually goes. You go from playing, being resident at a club, um, locally and then from there you kind of use that as a platform to kind of boost of up uh, hopefully give a chance to play in other places but we don't have that so you have to either put on your own night get clouded up or whatever and it's just you know it requires a lot of work a lot of extensive work obviously now it's better with social media you can upload a, a, a clipping clip of you playing um via a stream clip of you playing from a stream somewhere that clip can go viral and suddenly your career can kind of blow up overnight that can happen too but i think in general representation is needed across the board doesn't only necessarily go to black and brown people. I think there are many white people out there who are sitting around thinking, I've been playing for 12 years, mate. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm really good, but I haven't had the ability to play in places because I just haven't had the chance. No one's given me the opportunity to do so. Um, so without that kind of op opening an industry, how are they able to get into it? Especially now, if it's all going to be just based solely on, on representing unrepresented communities and minorities, which obviously is important, but still it's just everyone needs to be represented in general. And then of course, then what you do with the minorities and people that are not represented 
did in black and brown people is that you would say let's empower these communities so them to feel comfortable to come into these spaces come to these clubs be in these venues talk to these people because of course no one's denying that there definitely is an issue with how black and brown people are treated in these clubs and spaces but things are changing slowly but surely but you should put in a position where you can empower them with a fund or whatever it may be to set up their own nights, you know, uh, put on club nights in d different places, organize events, talks, whatever it may be, like, or maybe get some of the more higher profile people from that scene to play in different festivals. So maybe introduce another crowd into there, whatever it needs you, just to kind of give it a refresh. But I'm just glad to see they're doing a follow up event. But again, it's interesting to see what the topics are going to be, what they're going to talk about, how they're going to go about doing it. But I'm glad to see it's not just stopping at the Blackout Tuesday Square thing, it's progressing onto something else all right and on to kind of putting words into uh, in, to kind of putting those words into action and hoping now with the reopening of the dance music scene and you know nightlife scene in general that we're hopefully not just going to go back to how it was before we're going to go back into nightlife with a change we're seeing different people different faces i always said before when i used to promote nights and i used to sometimes just book uh, female djs for the for the for the heck of it especially like a couple of months back to back just to freshen things up there's no denying that there's definitely a different ambience and vibe sonically atmospherically ambience wise when you walk into a club and it's a female dj playing it's just different you know it, you feel it you know around you people are there it's just a different vibe different groove and you'd like that you want to introduce that kind of new sound new flavors um new sonics into the atmosphere that you're playing into instead of just the same old tired shit because that's not what you want that's not club culture is kind of built on and you want to obviously inspire the new generation to feel as if that they can step up and be able to fill in those shoes of those icons that they've seen before and any way to do it is to give them the opportunity and platform to do so and of course this is one of them so let's continue with the article Blackout Music Coalition to host a series of talks about progressions since Blackout Tuesday. It says the Blackout Music Coalition will host a series of panel talks to reflect um, on the industry since last year's Blackout Tuesday. One of the talks will be set in the iconic Elgar Room of the Royal Albert Hall, which is obviously pictured here. Um, in the collaboration with events organizers, the future is. We'll discuss what the challenges, if any, have been made since Blackout Tuesday. This will be a, in front of a live audience of 150 people. Panelists Zion Edwards and Wretch Free 2, who are legend, We'll assess how these changes are being accounted for and those who benefit, um, how we can ensure that these things are designed or changes are designed to survive while also growing within the music world. In addition to the event, Royal Albert Hall on Friday, September 24th, BMC's YouTube account will be broadcasting two panel discussions shot the day before at the Abbey Road Studio One. The panelists will address their experiences as a black person navigating the area of industry and changes they've noticed in the field since Blackout Tuesday in this closed door session. Okay, interesting. That's going to be closed door. I'd, I'd actually want it to be open. So I can actually view it or listen to it, you know, in real time myself, because that'd be very kind of um in interesting to listen to them talk about it from the standpoint of labels of course you've got the ones listed there blackout tuesday was an international demonstration against police violence and racism the action which began as a protest to the murders of george floyd um amud Ahmed Arbery, Brianna Taylor in the music industry um, took place in June 2nd, 2020. Businesses that participated were asked to refrain from releasing music and engaging in their economic activities. At the time, the moment was um, criticized for being performative and tokenism, which I tokenistic, which obviously I said. Uh, it has now been over a year since Back Out Tuesday, and the aim is a series of programs just to review what changes have been made within the industry itself. The days after Black Out Tuesday, the Black Music Coalition was formed to hold the music industry accountable and ensure that the numerous pledges were made were kept i know a few of the fashion stuff weren't kept they kind of read writ manifestos about changes changing that and they're still the same cool but i do hope that what black hatches they did do was empower people to kind of kind of be the change they wanted to see and just set up their own things whether it was this accountability sort of council whether you're setting up your own sort of instagram account and highlighting and promoting the work of unrepresented people whether it was you sending more pictures into places like resident advisor and mixed megan dj May, just to kind of put your voice front and center and kind of force them and shame them into kind of producing or publishing your work whether it's you kind of emailing clubs and kind of holding them hostage and blackmailing them into kind of booking you whatever i hope that many people just put stuff into action and try and put their best foot forward instead of just kind of waiting for things to change which it never does but i usually do things sometimes off the back of those kind of tragic moments in history like you know of course the death of george floyd and the other two in terms of um ahmed albury and brianna taylor some good can come of it in terms of changing an industry and allowing things to be nothing's ever going to be fair but to just be somewhat some, to be some sort of level of parity when i go to these club events when i go out you see the dance floor is so diverse you just want the 
to kind of line up and the people putting these things together to be as diverse as the flipping people on the on the dance floor i go to places like a pussy palace and stuff and of course it's on like a certain level but those pussy palace parties are like so um or inspiring to see that many people from all these walks of life different genders races color creeds all raving and having a great time people playing that i have no idea who they are absolutely slaying behind the decks and even performing wise and it's absolutely fantastic to see really really fantastic and it goes to show that it is possible to do but you know you have to give those people a platform right to be able to to basically to be able to present that kind of party on the biggest stage to a bigger crowd in the hope that they can get the normies involved, in the hope that that will change or kind of refine their taste palette so that they'll be happy to see someone like that play out like a love box, to be able to play a time warp, all those kind of things. But until you do that and make that change and make that step, you're still going to have the same people playing in those kind of places, you know, whatever. You know, I don't need to mention the names. You know who they are who play the same places all over again and we don't need it. We don't need it. Especially going forward now, it's just a little bit dead, a little bit stale. Um, there's far more interesting, um, layered, textured, rich music out there that exists. Doesn't matter on your colour creed, white, black or whatever. Let's just have some freshness and hopefully off the back of this with there's some freshness guests that I'm introduced into it. It says here to end, they began writing an open letter in the industry, noting that for far too long the black community has experienced racial injustice, inequality and disenfranchisement. Um, throughout all parts of society and that here in the UK it's no different since sending letter they have been working as an organisation on initiatives and actions that exemplify their only goal of combating anti-black racism and discrimination in the music industry I wish I could really tap into that sort of shit and be the person that kind of you know uses my colour and my background as their way to kind of shoehorn and get myself into industry because it is a good tactic the same way how I've kind of talked about my friend who I said at the time that she was starting to kind of you know take djing seriously i was like hey you might as well just utilize the gift god-given gifts that you've been given in terms of your bazookas and just use them as a way to kind of you know get yourself front you know front and center and then hopefully when people kind of click on your videos or click on your profile because they like what they see they'll be like oh wow you're also an amazing dj it's gross it's nasty i understand but sometimes you have to use what you have to use just to get your foot into the industry it is what it is it's so cutthroat who was that kind of girl i forgot who she said um one girl and russian girl i forgot her name the russian girl that goes out with etta kyle forgot her name right really you know kind of cute little russian girl brunette she said that she used to dj if i'm not mistaken she would do these weird dj tours in china where you had to kind of dj as a t topless it was what's called a topless dj tour or something stupid like that where they basically hire all these pretty girls from parts of eastern or central europe to go and dj in places like china um in hotels or in you know underground bars and raves and whatever for these high level businessmen and you know obviously seriously gross and i think they got paid like i don't know a thousand dollars per gig and most of it went to whoever they kind of quote unquote pimp was but that was her way to get involved in the industry right again objectified um discriminants you know whatever yeah right? it's just you know i can't imagine the amount of abuse that she suffered um working in that kind of industry but that is what allowed her to get her foot in the industry and then from there be able to build on to do other things and i'm sure if she didn't do that naked dj thing more than likely she wouldn't have the career she has now it's just one of those weird things in djing and sometimes you just need a moment whether it's bless madonna you know f smashing the fuck out of that mixer whether it's um jada g playing some mad vinyl set a yeah, flipping deck mantle um everyone needs something right the hook the first thing cheryl you know having that um moment where the guy kind of pulled back her tune uh you know without permission all those things kind of give you the spark give you the highlight and then you take that and you kind of run with it so sometimes just using your race your gender to kind of get yourself through the door can be a worthwhile thing but just for myself i just can't do it i just want to be undeniable i want to be as good as my heroes and idols i looked up to and they didn't waste any time on these sort of things of course their time coming up was far different than i but i would much rather want to be able to get forward and get progress you know through the sweat of my own brow than just being tokenized in that way but the way the music industry is set up it kind of forces you to do so it does it really does and unless you take advantage of it whether it's a controversy you know just look at the back of the Jonah Lucas and flipping, uh, what's his name? Karen Civil situation. They're obviously beefing about a really serious issue, potentially fraud, potentially scamming, um, potentially, you know, lying about your ability to kind of deliver on a promise. All these kind of things are happening, you know, essentially stealing $60,000 or maybe not making as much use of it as he kind of wanted out of Karen Civil. And, you know, instead of using that moment to kind of, you know, hold her accountable and maybe get your money back, he's like, you know what, let's just use it as a time to kind of amplify and shine light on the stuff I'm doing. He then releases a single off the 
back of it and now suddenly you got people talking about your music again I probably won't talk about it before because of all the light that's coming on this really next situation onto a good situation so again it's a bad thing it's a bit cringy it's awful it says a lot about the society we live in at the moment but it just is what it is it really is what it is and there's nothing we can do to kind of fight that sort of thing so i understand the need to have a black coalition a black music coalition in that regard i understand the reason why people want to go to these kind of places to speak um to use them as an opportunity to kind of you know get themselves in the industry because it's really difficult out there to make it it really is. especially if you don't make if you don't make music or you don't make remixes or edits and you're not clouded up and you don't have you know good friends in the industry who can allow you to tour with them or open their parties whatever it's going to be difficult for you really really difficult it really is um to make it just purely based on how good you are because i can't speak for other places but london specifically shoes you could throw a stone and hit a dj like you know in a couple of yards the amount of ability to dj just f forget in most places just look at just like warehouse spaces in north london in east london here in hackney wick just those kind of spaces outside of the people that play after parties for galleries, events, outside of people who play week on week in Soho clubs, all those things, these people are really good, really good. And you don't hear nothing about them. Um, and, you know, there's many, many of them out there. So for them to break through and become like the next people playing at these clubs, like, you know, the cause, the fold uh, on, a, on a weekly, monthly basis and with other places, it's very difficult to get to that level. Once you do, it's, it's fine. Once you step, you know, like most stuff. And once you get that little look in, it's kind of fine to kind of carry on, but it's very difficult just to get that little carry on step. So hopefully this is a way to do so and put some of those things into action. Um, a bit of a report card there. The event against happening, what? uh when's it happening oh september the 24th it starts so definitely keep an eye out for that keep an eye out for that <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. let's move on here what else have we got here let's move on there let's move on there okay let's talk about this before we finish what should we talk about this or this what should we talk about what should we talk about before we finish, what should we talk about? This, 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 right? Okay. Yeah, let's talk about this. So, update on here, right? So, a little update on the Gabby Petito missing person. Now, obviously, murder inquiry that's happening now in the States. Um, it looks like Gabby Petito's fiance has now had a arrest warrant out for him, obviously, since her body's been found. And he's uh, basically the only person of interest, it seems like, from all the investigations that have gone on so far. Um, that's obviously tragic news in terms of a conclusion. And then we also have this update courtesy of the Daily Beast that says cops who pulled over van wife couple were told fiance hit Gabby Petito, right? So, if you're not familiar, there was a video that was going around of the interaction uh between gabby petito brown laundry and a police officer who basically pulled them over because um uh, a passerby had seen them arguing or maybe striking each other when the officer got to the scene for whatever reason he was led to believe that gabby petito there was the aggressor and brown laundry wasn't because he was very calm and very you know well mannered in terms of how he was speaking it just didn't seem like he was the one that was getting there even though he was the one that had the scratches of course so he surmised maybe gabby petito was just was a, a, a aggressive themselves and of course people in the comments are saying hey um most people that are in a violent relationship they usually want to cover for their partner whenever a police officer gets involved or somebody with from authority they don't obviously want to get them in trouble because they feel as if they're like you know being put into a situation that they can't really control get out of um so usually it's up to the police officer to recognize the signs and basically whatever happens try and separate the both of them maybe take the guy to jail to call off whatever it may be and people are basically saying that you know maybe if it was the other way around and it was sort of a conventional he hit her situation that Gary Petito maybe still would have been alive now because he would have had you know what maybe a couple of hours maybe 24 hours to chill in the jail before he gets bailed out Gary Petito may be able to go home and things might have changed in their relationship and whatever maybe went separate ways and she might have been still alive now again it's all what ifs and maybes but still it is kind of a sad indictment on the differences and how genders are treated whenever again they get pulled over by police and of course generally in race as well right when you look at them because you think yourself if Brian Laundry was a black dude like if I was you know Gary Petito's fiance I'm pretty sure that regardless of what I told the police officer I would definitely get arrested and be put it back in a, a flipping police car in it that's without a shadow of a doubt but 
this does bring me on to a point which was mentioned in the comments below of the video that i put out before about people coming on here and feeling a little bit like i was misreporting things and not reporting something accurately i just want to say this clearly i'm sure most people are aware of this right most people should be aware of this because essentially i'm just a guy with a shitty macbook a webcam a pretty decent microphone plugged into a focus right you know talking to you via the internet right i'm no one i'm a nobody i work a normal nine to five i go out in the evenings i go to the gym in the mornings i shit i sleep same as you guys do nothing different i'm just talking out my ass this podcast for the most part is an opportunity for me to kind of make myself or yeah to sort of like help me in my ability to kind of make myself sane or to stop me from going mad because i don't have many friends and i don't really have an opportunity to kind of offload most of these things i think about and speak about so this is the best way to me to do so right to speak directly into this microphone into a camera and obviously have you guys listen to it have you listen to it via podcast app watching it on youtube whatever it may be i'm just reporting on what i see at the time without research on the news right when i'm reading it and i'm obviously giving you my opinion off the cuff as i'm talking to you now and maybe stuff that i've kind of ruminated over the last couple of days and so but that's it I am not a resource for information or stone cold facts or whatnot. If you want that, you go to the news sources, you read the plethora of articles that exist out there, you break down videos, there's people on YouTube doing really in-depth studies of what they call them internet sleuths who have been able to kind of help and assist the police in basically finding, unfortunately, where the body might have been located and maybe kind of pointing towards the fact that it might allegedly be the fiancé who was responsible for her death. There's all these amazing people that are really great resources for information you should be going to. Not me. I'm not an information resource. I'm an entertainment resource. I'm a cultural critic, right? I'm an art, whatever it may be. Yeah? I kind of sometimes dabble some of my art and the stuff that I produce on this channel as well. But for the most part, this is a cultural commentary podcast. Me just commentating on things that happen in the culture and giving my two cents on it. That's it. And also, it's pretty, I think idiotic to kind of sit there wherever you may be around the world and think just because I have the same skin tone as you that somehow I'm going to share the same views. Number one, I'm from a completely different country. I'm from a completely different background. I was raised a completely different way. I have loads of different influences that I've kind of grown up among. Just because you share the same skin tone as somebody doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the same views in life, let alone the same interests, right? There are things I'm interested in that most of my friends that look like me or where are, are from where I'm from are not into. I'm really into heavy metal. I don't really talk about it here, but I've been to Downloads Festival a couple of times in my life. I go to you know metal gigs a lot. I've been going to them since I was, what, 18 years old. That's something I do a lot. I like to do. I don't necessarily see a lot of people there that look like, that look like me, but I wouldn't just assume because they're there and they look like me that they'd also be into the bands I was into because it's just all personal preference sort of stuff. And I interpret the stuff the way I interpret it through my experiences and whatever I've kind of seen and grown up with. And then I obviously relate that on the podcast. And that's all I try to do. That's all. I don't try to be super Mr. Information because that's not me. And I'm not really interested in doing that sort of stuff. I want to, you know, um, provide you with as much to date stuff that's happening in the culture now and just give you my take that's it i'm sure most of you are doing that you're only coming to hear my take on situation not actually coming to hear the actual facts of the matter because again i'm just a dude but to have people kind of you know here and going at me because of that is just insanely weird in my in, in my opinion and again i understand it i get the frustration if i don't share your opinion someone looks like you it can be a little bit annoying to hear somebody kind of go against the grain and be a little bit quote unquote controversial i don't try and be that i'm just an independent thinker i've always have been i never follow the trends i never follow the group think i try and kind of attack things at a different angle and that's all i try and do and try and express things as clearly and articulately as i can from my own point of view not from somebody else's just my own i could read an article here and not agree with what's being said but i could also understand where the person's coming from and hopefully you guys can do the same thing with me and i said if you can't fair play no problem but I'm not here to try and appease anybody because we happen to share the same skin tone or the same racial background and stuff. It's just insanely naive and pretty simple minded to think that way. But again, I understand what you're thinking that way, but don't come to me expecting me to be flipping the oracle of news and people providing you with hard hitting facts and stories. That's just not what I'm going to do. It never is. But anyway let's get back to the story so courtesy of daily beast cops who pulled over a van life couple were told fiance hit gabby petito it says the following police officers in moa utah responding to reports of a dispute between the doomed van life couple gabby petito and brand laundry who is now a person of interest in the homicide were told by a dispatch that laundry 
the brain, the do fiance, had reportedly hit Petito during the August 11th argument new release audio reveals. Um, the reporting party states a male hit a female. The police dispatch says over the radio, domestic, he got into a white, white Ford Transit van, has a black ladder on the back, Florida plate. The female got hit. They both, the male and the female, got into the van and headed north. So clearly, the police officer that went to go and to engage and pull them over knew that the male had been the aggressor, which, again, goes to show... If anything, a lot of these things that occur, obviously bad timing, bad luck, wrong place, wrong time. But it also just goes to show the negligence and the mistakes that just happen in just day to day life. But unfortunately, because it's cops and they're having to deal with people, the consequences are far more extreme, right? Someone could legitimately lose their life, right? Lose a limb, have a life debilitating industry, in the injury, wherever it may be. So the cost of making a mistake at that level are far higher. But it also needs to be said that it's quite clear, especially in America, there's a clear difference between how you're treated if you're white, between how if you're from a certain minority. It just is clear. And we know for a fact, if this was maybe, maybe it's different, if it was two black people, two Hispanic people, two Latino people, um, I don't really, I wouldn't necessarily say they maybe would have got taken to jail just to cool off. I don't think so. But for sure, if the dude was black, even if he was an athlete, it doesn't matter for sure they would have definitely took him to jail just to call him down to question him it would have been embarrassing it would have come out oh my god you hit your wife da, 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 wife to be cool but at least she would have still been alive right we can categorically say that most likely if that would happen it would still have been alive because you know many hours after the fact that's when allegedly she went missing and of course then the, her body was found so quite clearly whatever argument that they had at that point might have affected how they interacted with each other later down the line because if you know anything about toxic relationships between men and women it was just in people in general um when you're in a relationship like that it doesn't necessarily it's very rare that your arguments just stop out of the blue they usually continue on for hours on end until somebody obviously decides to kind of walk away and be the bigger person but they do kind of kind of they do tend to kind of roll on roll on roll on and especially if you got violent at that point there is no real end to where that can go to the tapes obtained by fox 13 salt lake city helps paint a fuller picture of the narrative laid out in the incident report filed by one of the cops after the encounter which somehow ended the police viewing petito 22 as the aggressor in this previously released 911 shortly before the officers were dispatched a witness tells the operator we drove by him a gentleman was slapping the girl they ran up and down the sidewalk they proceeded to hit her hopped in a car and they drove off so that's what it goes to show Again, apart from being the prejudice involved in police officers in the States or in general, there is definitely a lack of just good police officers. They just shit their job, like stone coldly bad at what they do. Quite clearly, we see them. We see many mistakes, many errors along the way where they just keep fucking up and doing really shitty things that lead to people essentially, you know, it leads to people kind of losing their life over the back of it. Or, you know, again, like, you know, maybe getting severely injured or having life altering injury, whatever it may be. It happens all the time at the hands of police, especially police in America for the most part. And this should be really one of the stories of the day, not off the back of, oh yeah, we're not underrepresented communities are not being represented. Cool. But there is clearly an issue here with the ability to police and to resolve in incidents and to be able to assess the danger and able to you know understand what's happening because i'd imagine a lot of police officers have a lot of experience with dealing with domestic disputes even though they they shouldn't be dealing with that sort of stuff right they should be trying to hunt murderers rapists and all this sort of stuff and kidney fillers right they should be trying to do that but i would imagine a lot of their day-to-day -day is just done conflict resolutions right even in the workplace or at home they're constantly going through these kind of things and you should be able to tell when somebody is in a right relationship when they're trying to cover the back of their fiance, when maybe it's not as it seems or what you're seeing there, you should be able to say, you should be able to discern it with all those years of experience. You know, people, police officers always say, I've got 20 years experience, I've never seen so-and-so. You should be able to know when a situation isn't what exactly appears on the eye or what, you, or what they're trying to present to you in person. You should be able to see. <laughs> Um, laundry and Pet laundry Petito's 23 year old fiance inexplicably returned home to Florida without Petito two weeks later in the report a copy of which the Daily Beast required um, uh, got officer Eric Pratt wrote it appeared that a male and a female had left the scene traveling north of the day. I believe the report the male had been observed to be assaulting a female I wonder if he's going to get any charges or he's going to be reprimanded in his job because he failed right really badly like legitimately failed at his job this officer um, Eric Pratt 
But after interviewing Petito and Laundry, as well as connecting the, uh, contacting the witnesses that called 911 in the first place, Pratt came to a different conclusion. Petito and Laundry had some sort of argument. He wrote, um, tried to create distance by telling Petito to walk down and calm down. He says, however, Petito didn't want to be separated, began slapping him. The report continues. The documents claims Laundry grabbed Petito by the face and pushed her back as she pressed upon him and the van. The fight erupted over the phone, according to the report. More likely than not, that's probably what ended up letting her to her death. I'd imagine it's very unlikely for a dude to just suddenly wake up and want to kill his wife, especially that young. I'd imagine he had a very toxic relationship, very dangerous relationship in that regard, maybe very violent, but he probably, especially out in a nature park, you know, in the middle of nowhere, loads of hard, sharp objects around. They get into some sort of argument. He pushes her back. She falls over, hits her head like a movie somewhere. I'd imagine, I don't know. Now, again, what happens after the fact, if it's a mistake or it's an error, cool. But what happens after the fact is what makes you a sicker, right? Deciding to pull the body, put it in the back, try and bury it, all this sort of mad stuff for somebody that you allegedly love is wild. And then to come back home and refuse to talk to the police and get representation straight away and then go for a hike and disappear is nuts, right? So quite clearly he's guilty, <laughs> quite clearly. But for sure, if the officer would have stepped in at that time that he had an interaction, God damn it, man. Um, no one reported that the male struck the female both the female and the male reported they were in love um, and engaged to be married and desperately didn't wish to anyone to see the charge with a crime says Pratt's um, wire trap write up sorry which goes on to assert that laundry did not exhibit any indicators that he may be the victim of bad boyfriend syndrome even though he had scratches on his face and stuff I don't know it doesn't make sense um, and that he was assessed to be a low risk of danger and harass as a result of proximity you are never going to see that ever written for an IC free male ever for black male Brown mis never assess that low risk of danger or harm as rose of proximity to Petito. Imagine blonde hair, blue eyed girl, as pretty as she is, and I'm standing next to her, and I'm going to be proven as the non aggressor. Really? Never happening. In a body cam video of the encounter later released by authorities, the second officer had been seen telling Petito that he has decided not to cite for a domestic violence battery. He says it was only going to be a class D misdemeanor. However, the domestic violence per portion of the enhances it, makes it a life major pain in the butt, especially your 22, right? So he tried to help him out, which is understandable, but. Um, police Petito told police officer that she was frightened that laundry was going to leave her behind in Moab. According to incident report, they both suffered from extreme anxiety. The two said in India, the responding officers declared the incident to be a mental and emotional health break rather than a domestic dis assault. I am separating you tonight. The officer detailing Petito says, I want you guys to be tonight. I want you guys to go. I want you guys both to be tonight away from each other. Relax and breathe. I understand this can feel like a nightmare, but you're going to have a golden flower out on top of it. So I'm pretty sure after it, they probably just met up again. Um, cops released the van um, to Petito, who illegally owned the van, and arranged a motor room for laundry. Officers told Petito where she could take a shower for four or five bucks. One of them said laundry as he drove him to the motel. I told her to go to the shower because she seems to a lot, a lot like my wife. And uh, and these things really worked for my wife, and it was what gets her stressed out to take a long hot shower the footage concludes with officer checking laundry into a local motor room and shaking his hand as he says goodbye most likely then they met after the fact and the rest is history petition laundry duh, 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 duh. and then of course the update here is that he's been formally charged it says the federal court has issued this arrest warrant um for laundry um, no it's been officially arrest warrant's been put out he's not been charged according to the bureau of the investigation the warrant is issued on wednesday um issued a warrant for just for brian christopher laundry duh, 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 duh. Following the death of Mr. Petito, Mr. Laundry, who has been to Petito's fiance, is still missing. Police have been searching for him in the Calvert um, Carlton Nature Reserve in Sarsosta, Florida. Specifically, Laundry has been charged with fraudulently using someone else's debit card from over the 3rd of August to the 1st of September, spending with drawing 1000 or more. He has not at this point been charged with Petito's homicide, but he has been possession of interest in the missing person's case. Interest. So they can't charge him for the homicide yet because I guess the dna and evidence doesn't point to it because maybe his prints and stuff isn't on file i don't know um i guess so maybe so they had to get him on this him using the bank details or the bank card that's the to petito uh, between the times that she obviously over the after the time she had of course passed away 
which I'm sure if his lawyers will probably be able to explain because they were together in a relationship and so on and not. But it is looking really, really bad, you know. He leaves his parents home. He doesn't tell them where he's going. More likely than not, he obviously did the crime and he's definitely going to be brought to justice. But again, man, like a sad situation all in all. Again, I wasn't a fan of people using it as opportunity to kind of denigrate the death of one girl to bring attention to another. I think you can talk about two things at the same time, but do it with tact. Uh, do it without being a, a bit of a prick, basically. And you can also use it and do it as opportunity to shine the platform or shine a light on people from disadvantage or unrepresented communities not being you know put on the put on the flipping main news because they're not blonde with blue eyes and do it on your platform and i see people doing it. i've seen some people doing it especially on twitter recently i've seen people turning their social media feeds into basically ad hoc sort of missing person platforms where they'd be able to share news of people who have been unreported and missing for a long period of time because they're from you know minority community people are maybe not that bothered about them and little by little some resolutions have been found some tragic more than others but it's good to see people taking active steps to change things as opposed to just pointing and saying to people oh you should be talking about her because this person hasn't been talked about it's like no don't denigrate one death to bring light on the other both families are suffering let's just use the opportunity to shine light on everybody that's missing especially during these bleak moments in time in history going through a pandemic we should be a little bit more empathetic sympathetic to whatever people are going through because we're all struggling in our own way regardless of what we are in terms of our socioeconomic level we're all kind of struggling to get back on our feet and get acclimatized with whatever this new world is that we're living in at the moment we still don't seem to be able to shake it it's like a bad hangover the pandemic is not over still people are still dying cases are still erupting in certain places you look at what's going on in new zealand and australia you know my heart goes out to people that live in those kind of countries it's absolutely you know it's absolutely t tyrannical in terms of how they're being treated their restrictions and freedom you know being placed in everywhere in the terms of life they're going through so i don't know man i wish people to just be a little bit more a little bit nicer to each other i guess in those situations isn't it and because this turned into a really toxic situation really really quickly i understand what she looks like and the undevoted attention they gave to it i get it that'll make you angry but let's just relax in it let's just relax a little bit but yeah um that's the conclusion arrest warrant out for brian laundry he probably did it um if he didn't do it he's gonna have one hell of a time to try and convince people he didn't do it because more likely not in the situations you know, more likely than not, it's a somebody as close to, to you that's going to be able to exact such level of fucking viciousness and pain and violence to you that will eventually lead to your death. And it is what it is. And force of feeling because I have to go over to you, it her and her family and hopefully they can put a close the situation. Brian Laundry's found and, you know, we can go ahead and kind of close this book as soon as possible and let people move on and try and recover and restore whatever life they have left now at the moment. But, you know, it's tragic all around. It's tragic all around. Um, I guess that might be it, you know. Let's end it there because it's already getting late and I have to go to bed. So thanks so much for tuning in, as usual. It's been a pleasure to have your company. As I said before, this is the 200th episode of the Agassin Zinga Show. It's been an absolute blast, right? Absolute mad one. Um, I've had a great time. I'm sweating as per usual, as I always do when I'm having a good time on here. And I don't know, like I said, I want to thank you all again for tuning in. Um, 500 episodes it's been an absolute pleasure to have the company of you guys wherever you are around the world supporting me giving me loads of words of encouragement loads of hate i love it too everything i love i understand it i get it if i saw myself speaking to the camera hours upon end for 500 episodes i'd probably hate myself as well i probably do secretly hate myself which is why i'm trying to present myself as a good person on camera this way i don't really know who knows we'll talk about that another day but again thanks so much for tuning into your excellent zing show episode number 500 if you liked what you hear make sure you subscribe you like you see all my the links on my description add me on social all that good stuff that'd be much appreciated of course if you're listening to this for the podcast that please leave me a five-star review so people can find the show and of course support for your patrons always welcome as well at patreon.com for agostino you get bonus content every week available on patreon only for patreon subscribers at patreon.com for agostino i'll see you again very very soon take care peace 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 peace